at 9 a.m. We'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. And uh, Ms. Julie Waddell has verified that we do have a quorum today. So uh, we can go ahead and get started. And uh, first uh, thing we're gonna do is do the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Jordan, would you lead us please? You'll remain standing. Uh, pastor Daryl Johnson is the associate pastor of True Life Church in Joshua, Texas, and he's going to lead us in our invocation. Pastor, please. First of all, I want to say thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here today. If you will, bow your heads, please. Lord, thank you today for this wonderful day that we're here to be in your presence. and. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we can come before you and put you first in this meeting. And Lord, I ask you to bless each board member. Uh, Lord, I ask and pray that you give them strength and give them wisdom. And Lord, give them discernment to follow after you in every decision and every thought. I pray for this community and I ask you to bless this wonderful county that we get to live in and every home that's in it. And Father, I ask you to guide in each and every step and every decision that's made that it will reflect your character today. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Um, so um, we have, let's see. That's public comments. Okay, we have four speakers today for our public comment section, and then we have two specifically for uh, our um, budget hearing. So we'll get started. Oh, okay. Um, Mr. We'll Chairman? Yes. Um, we have an executive session to hear from Patricia Nolan. Uh, there's been some confusion about what she's been told about whether she will be in executive session or not. I'd like to clarify that she does not need to speak in public comments if she's going to be in the executive session. Uh, well, my plan is this to uh, go into executive session and begin the discussion and I had already had a conversation with her that if we felt the need to get any clarification on any points that we could, uh, if we had a majority or of the, of the group back there to invite her back there to clarify any questions that we may have. That's still the plan. And so um, it's completely up to you how you want to approach that. Uh, I, I've spoken with you and so, and I know Mr. Diaz has spoken with you as well. And so I think, um, you know, we'll just go with that at this point. Uh, well, let me clarify uh, for the record that two board members asked that that specifically be included on the agenda. I think that's consistent with our board's rules, uh, and I don't think we're complying with the rules. Her uh, issue is on the agenda, um, and that's how we, uh, that's what she requested for us to discuss that, for us to address it. Her, her, um, her request, Mr. Chairman, is not the issue. Two board members have made a very specific request to do uh, the executive session early. It's near, it's after, at the end of the agenda, that Ms. Nolan be allowed to do her uh, presentation uh, before we do that, uh, at least at the first of the executive session, and that she be uh, allowed to do that in private with us. All those things are yes well <clears throat> again um, I want to respect the chair and, and your position and and uh, you know you have a, a overall view but you know this is a in my point of view discussing a personnel issue and I'd much rather be discussed in executive session than in public comment because I don't think that's fair to anybody and on the other hand in order to hear 
to understand what the concern are, uh, we would have to hear it from the person, not from someone reporting on the person. So I, I would lean very heavily for her uh, having a conversation in the executive session. Uh, leaving it up to her, she's rolling the dice as to whether or not she's going to be heard or not. But again, my, the, my biggest concern is it's a person, in my point of view, it's a personnel issue, which I, I would rather not be, uh, at least initially, a public issue. I well, would and ask we can, our attorney if, if a motion uh, right now is appropriate that we hear P Patricia Nolan in executive session so she has clarity and we have clarity. That's what I was going to say. Wait, I don't know if we need a motion. I was just going to take a sense of the board. If you have, we have a majority of the board that wants her in executive session, I'd be open to that um, because, yeah, the majority of the board wants that. Can, can you clarify what the request is? Is it that she speak in executive session and I believe not in that's the public what, session, or is speaking both, or just executive, just executive session. session? Just executive session. If, if there's clarity now, she can avoid going to the microphone and talking about all of her issues I think publicly. I personally think that's appropriate. Okay, sounds good to me. Ms. Nolan, you clear on that? Well, when, when we start the executive session, we'll invite you back there. Thank you. Um, so, uh, do, then do you not want to come and speak in a couple of comments? Okay. This number has grown a good bit. Okay, George for, Dodson, please. For the record, uh, Ms. Nolan just indicated she is not going to speak at public comment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dodson? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, do, I, do I need to state my uh, address? Please. Okay. 7309 Balmoral Drive, Colleyville. I come before the board to share my frustrations that I have shared with you for four years now. The IT operations at TAD have continually failed our citizens. I originally came to express my concerns with the ongoing issues with Almenton uh, four years ago. There's the software that only Tarrant County uses in Texas, and as I understand, it's only used one other appraisal district in the U.S. It's now been installed for nine years or in the process, and has been operational for over seven years. And continued issues are happening. I suspect, by the way, I suspect that the May 2023 disaster that with the website had interface issues with Almenton. However, I don't know that. In addition to going live, with a redesigned website when it was not rigorously and thoroughly tested. I also learned that TAD was not measuring the usage of the applications and was surprised to learn the actual users of their applications and systems. That's, to me, that's, that's a, a, a terrible uh, oversight. The board has not chosen to conduct an audit or review of the overall operations during the four years that I've been coming here. I'd like to know why you, you, apparent, you would not let the finances go unaudited. And it boggles my mind why you don't at least take this step to require an external qualified consultant or consultant organization to examine the operations. TAD is operating according to Mr. Law's leadership, but there's no way the board can truly assess his leadership of IT and the processes and internal operations that are so critical to uh, the appraisal process. I want to know how many more IT disasters the board of directors are going to let happen and not remove the chief appraiser. In addition, in this meeting, the board is supposed to assess Mr. Law's actions against a letter of repair issued to him three months ago. I hope in making your decision, you truly take into consideration the actions he took against Chandler Crouch by Randy Armstrong. By the way, the board let Mr. Law choose the firm who investigated this, the situation, and the full report has never been released to the public. The board in that situation took a terribly weak action, giving Mr. Law and Mr. Armstrong each two weeks unpaid vacation as punishment. The terrible part of these actions is that Mr. Armstrong retired is now being paid a lifetime pension with zero penalty for his terrible, terrible actions against Mr. Crouch. I wonder if or when the board will decide they truly act as an oversight 
for governance like every corporate board is required to do. When corporate boards of directors see failures in company operations, they change the management to move in a different direction. We taxpayers feel rubber stamping the board is done in regard to Mr. Law's failures in the past must stop. You're not here to share coffee with Mr. Law and agree with every decision he makes in running the organizations. Your role should be hire and fire the chief appraiser to help ensure Tad is operating in a fair and efficient manner. As a longtime executive IT management consulting, my team and I were engaged by some of the largest corporations in America to investigate ongoing IT problems, to find the cause and propose changes in their operations. I can't understand why the board is so reluctant to take actions of this type. I see failures have continued for nine years, not just 90 days. When will the board stop rubber stamping? I have little faith that you'll take any actions. Please prove me wrong today. Oh, by the way, my house market appraisal has increased 85% in the last two years from being stable the prior three years. I hope my appraisal has not been call, called, called out because of my activities in monitoring Tad's operation. I have no idea how or why the increase was so much, but considering actions against Mr. Crouch, I would not be surprised in the least if some of the increase was tied to my oversight. I thank you so much for the opportunity in these past years to come forward and express my my considerations. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dodson. Uh, Daniel Bennett, please. Mr. Papa, Chair, board members. Good morning, Ms. Burgess. How are you? Fantastic. How are you? Morning. Um, I'd like to reiterate what Mr. Dodson just said, but I'd like to expand upon it. Uh, under Title 16, Rule 9471, a registrant, whether change of employment or change in the registration to TDLR, must concur with the rule of a 30-day notification. So I went online to look at the drop-down box for TAD employees. Well, these TAD employees are still listed. Randy Armstrong, Ryan Bucar, Deborah Cabello, Hannah Lee Garcia. They're both gone. They're all gone. Matter of fact, Ryan got curb walked because he went to go work for Southland tax agent. He didn't, uh, as far as I know, he, they boxed his stuff up and sent him out the door, which could be true, could not be true. I think if you go work for a tax agent, you're, you're given a quick exit. Uh, that's on the TDLR employee status page. Don't take my word for it. Let's go back to transparency now and accountability. <clears throat> As uh, when I walked in to sign in, I heard we only had three minutes, which is totally incorrect based on board policy. But looks like I have five today. That's wonderful news. Uh, at the uh, Keller meeting where Ms. Wildman was uh, trying to save her position, along with you, Mr. Pompa, you were there in her stead. Ross McMillan, an attorney, and Aaron Mazzani, who is, is also an attorney, attorney, said that this board was not being transparent and being less, less accountable. And you, you could waive the attorney-client privilege that Mr. Todd Clark so craftily put an amended report together for the public. Well, obviously there's more stuff within that particular document. He went on to say that if Ms. Wildman had just inferenced that they would consider waiving the attorney-client privilege, she would not have been recalled. But yet, you, you guys dug your heels in that night and she's not here. So I have to concur with Mr. Masani and Mr. Ross McMullen, <clears throat> their characterizations of you and Wildman's visit that evening. I have a question for this board. And this is an important question, each and every one of you. You as a board would be curious to ask whether the chief appraiser or any other staff employee senior staff, mid-level managers, whatever, met with an employee or employees to either find dirt or to gather information to discredit Patricia Nolan? I think that's a question I'd like you to ponder and maybe ask. 
And if this should be the case, and as a board, I think you would do a deep dive into this. Now, why do I bring that up, that suspicion? Because I've seen it in the past on many, many things, especially with the whistleblower document that occurred back in December 11th of 2018, no, 2017, that was the year of the election. So it's not uncommon to be brought into a room and questioned at length this, that, or this, or that. So knowing that someone's on the agenda to share with the board her experiences, I guess, I could imagine that happening. So I would hope that you would ask that question in executive session. Was anybody, any staff member, had a, was a party to any conference prior to her showing up today? To ask specifically about her. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Senator Crouch. Good morning, uh, board members, uh, Ms. Burgess and uh, Chairman. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> appreciate your comments. Uh, and uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, I was realizing just looked at the date and uh, realized today's uh, August the 11th this time last year I received a letter in the mail from TDLR clearing me of all allegations that were made against me by um, Randy Armstrong under the name of the Tarrant Appraisal District and uh, and you know in Facebook those things pop up and you're as a reminder when the anniversaries come up it's just so mind-blowing that that even happened and uh, how crazy it was um, and then of course the day after we had the board meeting and uh, uh, then the, the weird thing to me at that board meeting was that the five page summary we later found out there's 40 more pages of information that are currently being withheld just like Mr. Dodson said but um, on that five page summary it, there were edits made to the document to show that they saw that I had been cleared of all charges, but yet in that same document, they continued the, the high paid attorney, is a, the budget to pay that attorney was higher than any other attorney that I've looked at, although maybe Ms. Alder has something to say about that, who knows, anyway, so I'd, anyway, well, the, the attorney in that letter wrote things that still questioned my integrity, and I found that to be um, a problem and then later on when I found out there was 40 more pages that hadn't been released to the public I thought okay this is not something I'm okay with especially since uh, the allegation is that there's evidence of criminal violations in that document against me and it's just uh, that's it so uh, a lot has transpired over the past 18 months it certainly kept me pretty busy um, and uh, and I want to say that I think that a lot has happened since then to um, to improve things uh, and so um, I just there's some, been some really good things. There have been some things that still raise question. I think I think one thing I, uh, Mr. Laws reached out to me a number of times. We've had plenty of conversations. We have our differences, but uh, we get along. And um, and I, I want to acknowledge he's gone out, done a lot of public workshops and stuff. I think it's great. Um, and um, and then we've got the new website. Um, the board took certain actions. Um, I don't want to gloss over any of this stuff. There's just been a lot of stuff, some positive, some negative. Here's the overlying theme to me. The whole problem with the situation I was involved with, the reason why it got to the level it got to, is because of a cultural issue that's going on here of not dealing with issues head on. Instead, trying to shoo stuff to the side and not deal with it because it's painful. And then when you don't deal with it, it grows in magnitude. And then the problem that we have later on is much, much worse than it would have been if we would have just dealt with problems head on. And so uh, that is, it's almost like a habit. When you have a problem, just deal with it and move on instead of pushing the pain to the side. And I feel like that singular um, core value is one of the reasons why we've seen all of the problems we've had. We've got the, the website issue. I think that uh, Mr. Dodson, uh, there was a, uh, uh, board meeting that he spoke when I wasn't here I think it was in January and he had so many good points about how like he's got his opinions about the conclusions he's come to that you might disagree with but from his technical standpoint of 
the audits in the system, the different measures that take place. He has some great suggestions, and I was really, uh, it, it was great to hear a lot of you guys take those serious and then ask him questions later on in that meeting. I don't know if you remember or not, but I thought that was really good. The expertise he brings to the table from a technological side is just, is just tremendous. And the website is one of the central topics. I don't know if, I didn't see on the agenda if we're going to get an update there here on today on that. It seems like that would be an important thing if it's me, considering we're still not to where we need to be with the website. It looks like a lot of progress has been made. Um, there are a lot of different things that I, I wanted to talk about today. Of course, I can soak up five minutes like nobody's business, but um, I, I, just, I just want to acknowledge the, um, the position of the public in this thing. And uh, the way this, this, in, uh, this, this organization is run, it, it, it should be a, a, side, a side issue. We should be dealing with the legislative issues and the people, the problems people have with their values and, and, and not in this board particularly, but I'm just saying that should be front and center because that's, that's the core of the issue. This, how, the, how, how things have transpired here should be a side moment. And I just hope that uh, we can see uh, more heading towards problems, dealing with them head on, acting as leaders, doing things that may be uncomfortable, even though um, it take care of the issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Crouch. Uh, James O'Day. Oh, day. Thank you. My name is James O'Day. I just wanted to um, let the board of directors know what a great appraisal district that y'all are serving. Um, this is one of the best appraisal districts in the in the entire state. We work all almost every county in the state of Texas um, at our company, and there hasn't been another appraisal district that you can walk in and get your business done like here in appraisal district. Uh, the residential department this year has been probably the most efficient that it's ever been. Uh, I think that my dad's also going to speak on the commercial department and let y'all know about how, how things have gone with the commercial department this year. But if you walk into to Dallas County appraisal district and try to get your business done like you do at Tarrant appraisal district, you can't even get in the front door and go up the elevator to see someone. Um, Dallas County Appraisal District, in my opinion, is probably one of the worst run appraisal districts in, in the state of Texas. It, Tarrant County is absolutely the best, um, despite what some people may believe. Um, I know that there are other agents that don't work in Dallas County, so they don't know what issues transpire in other counties. But if you think that something wrong is going on at Tarrant Appraisal District, walk in the door of another appraisal district and see how you get treated there. Uh, here in appraisal district, it's just the best. And that's why we choose to hang our hat here in Tarrant County. And I hope it, I'm sure none of you have any experience, none of the people sitting on the board have experience at another appraisal district, but until you've had one and had bad experiences, and I know that there are people here who've, who've had bad experiences with Tarrant appraisal district, but the overall issue is that Tarrant appraisal district is still the best. So you may have you may have a have an issue at TAD someday, but in the end it gets resolved and the issues get worked out. And other appraisal districts that doesn't happen. So I just wanted to thank you um, all of y'all for serving on the board of directors here at TAD, and uh, appreciate the chief appraiser that we have. I don't think that there's another appraisal district that is run as efficiently as Tarrant Appraisal District. Just wanted to kind of applaud everybody and I um, think it's great that you got certified on time with as many uh, protests as were filed. I think that the certification was actually done earlier than the deadline. Uh, I just don't think that the uh, meeting was called to order to certify the role uh, earlier then it, it could have been done earlier. I just don't think that that meeting was called to, to order earlier uh, for whatever reason, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Day. Um, Mr. Chris O'Day. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Garland O'Day.
that they would state their residence. Sure. Would you please state your name and residence? My, my name is Garland O'Day, 1200 East Maddox, uh, Fort Worth, Texas. I've been in this business now for 47 years as a tax consultant representing taxpayers. I started as the <clears throat> assistant tax assessor in Arlington, Texas for five years while I attended UTA. During that time, I learned that uh, taxpayers don't understand the system. There hasn't been adequate education of the public to understand it. You don't know, the public doesn't know what goes on behind the doors when these appraisal districts are working. When this appraisal district started, I stupidly made an announcement to the newspapers and television stations that I was going to ask the board of directors to throw out the entire appraisal that first year because I didn't think they were fair. I've worked in many counties in Texas. Currently, we represent properties in about 40 different counties. Tarrant is the largest that, where we have the most clients because it's our home. This appraisal district, as my son James just mentioned, is the best in the state of Texas. I work all over the state. In 1995, I started a, an internet business. We hosted for free the websites for all the major counties in Texas. We didn't charge them a dime. You might look behind the scenes and say, well, you benefited from it, Mr. O'Day. Yeah, I did. I had their data. And I could use that data to determine where, where the problems were and where the efficiency was so good that there was no reason to even a challenge of, of, of value. The commercial department in Tarrant County is by far above any other county where we work. We can talk to the, to the appraisers, state our case, and they're reasonable in the decisions. It's rare that I even have to go to an appraisal review board hearing. In years past, I did. Today, though, the staff is, is trained. They, they understand the system. They understand how to value properties. And they listen to the public. I've had numerous cases in the, in this year where I have sat outside in the lobby in the, the customer service area and listen to people as they come in, not trying to eavesdrop. I'm waiting to see someone. And I hear conversations take place where the appraisers are, are just bending over backwards to listen and to act on the complaints about the value of a, of a property. And the appraisers act on it. This, this year, with a number, I don't even know how many protests were filed, but it was a large number because the values were increased substantially, and they should have been. Not in every case were they correct because the taxpayer has also a part to play in this, and if they don't bring the problems to the attention of the appraisal district, they can't fix it. They can't take care of the problems. Mr. Law and his staff have, uh, have shown professionalism in, in every situation that we've been involved in. I don't know any of the members of the board. I've never met any of you. Ms. Burgess, of course, we see the website and we see her photograph on the website and we, we use it and, and it's great. But 1995, when we started our internet business, we were the very first in the country to provide that service. And <clears throat> ultimately I sold the business and so I'm no longer involved in it, but uh, hats off to the appraisal district for the website that they have now. It's excellent. There's some, still some problems, but they're working on it, and they'll get it right. Uh, we've enjoyed using it. We enjoy working in this county. And again, Mr. Law has been, has been excellent uh, professionally and otherwise. And I think that uh, I, I just appreciate this appraisal district and the work they do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Day. Uh, Ger Gerald Miller. <clears throat> Good 
Good morning, board. Good morning, board chair, Madam Burke. Good morning, Mr. Miller. Please state your name, your full name, and your address. Gerald Miller, 254 West Last Lancaster, Fort Worth, Texas, 76102. I, um, fortunately, unfortunately, rather, like others, um, I have not brought my entire family to support my hidden agendas or business interests in Tarrant County and city. I don't have other families that's been in business, that served, that works with TAD. Um, and unfortunately, it seems as the only African American here, I am the arbiter of all people um, who have the skin tone that I do. And I can only attest to certain facts. The first is that the state of Texas, the governmental interest inside the state of Texas, have a historical documented history of a lack of transparency to its citizens. Just one case in point, we didn't find out we were free till 1865. <laughs> they didn't tell us for two years that it was an Emancipation Proclamation. They didn't want to give us the information. And this act of a failure of transparency has continued repeatedly throughout other state agencies, city agencies, governmental agencies. I can tell you, you know what it says on my birth certificate in Fort Worth, Texas, 1971, as ethnicity, Negroid. I was a Negroid. Yep, that's me. Um, the unfortunate part of that is that I find that with Tad, you know, my grandfather used to have a saying, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, probably is a duck. There seems to be deep problems with <laughs> Jeff Law. And those problems have been documented. Um, everybody can't be wrong. Everybody can't be lying. You know, if, if, if Jeff Law worked for me and my company, I would have to terminate him. Just because of the angst that he's caused, his failure to properly manage staff, um, his mismanagement, the lies that he's repeatedly told this board in open presence. And as a taxpaying citizen who pays for services, I don't pay to be lied to, right? That's why in a case that I've had to file against TAD and TARB, I'm subpoenaing Jeff Law and all the documents that you're trying to get your attorney over there is gonna to try to stop me from getting them, but I can establish relevancy and materiality. And I'm gonna get those records. And I'm gonna find out the dirt that y'all don't want people to know. And um, I'm gonna use that dirt in open court to question Jeff Law on the stand. Because he needs to be ultimately held accountable for his improper conduct, his improper mismanagement of staff resources, his intentional allowing of staff to commit crimes in the act of employment, which are all contradictory to the, t to the Texas cult. Somebody's got to hold them accountable. And if this board doesn't have the backbone to hold one man accountable for all of this, all of this for the last year or two, then maybe it's up for the citizens of the city of Fort Worth to hold them accountable, and I intend to. Thank you, Mr. Miller. That was our last speaker for the public comments section. Um, did I miss anybody? Okay. So uh, now we're going to start the public hearing on fiscal year 2024 Tarrant Appraisal District annual budget. And so uh, I have a total of three speakers here. Uh, I'll just go in order uh, again, uh, Mr. Bennett.
I want to take you back. I got five minutes. All right. I want to take you back to 2021. The August 2021 BOD agenda packet, page two, states number of employees to be compensated under the proposed 2022 budget is 212 which is an increase of one employee over the current budget. So we budgeted in 2022 for 212. Tad reported to the comptroller. It's on the comptroller's website. Don't take my word for it. Everything I say, don't take my word for it. Either ask the question or go look it up yourself. 197. That's what they reported to TDLR. So that materially differs from what was reported to the comptroller's office and what was reported to the public. So they budgeted for 212, they had 197, so by my estimation, that is roughly 16, plus or minus one or two. Now we know David Law's position wasn't filled for two years. And we know currently Mr. Armstrong, though on the TAD website with TDLR, as an employee, is no longer here. And we have an interim, which is sitting over there, Mr. Eric Watson. I understand he is in Mr. Law, Mr. Armstrong's office tenuously but let's go to the 2024 budget now proposes 214 full-time employees which is an increase of two employees over the current budget we need to ask mr law how many full-time employees worked in the year 2022 what is going to be reported to the comptroller's office because in 2021 is 197 in the packet to the public it was 212 so which is it? all right so the gap I've made my point. So I think that's material to the budget. That's, all, that's almost a million dollars. And I know we refund money every year to the taxing entities to dissuade any oversight. Hey, we're getting money back, Taz doing a great job. Sounds good. Good narrative, I love it, every year. What needs that money needs to be done, Mr. Puentes, is get a separate building for the ARB. Yeah, under, under the code, they're supposed to be separate. That's another budget item. Okay, let's continue. I got two minutes, 35 seconds. I'm not going to waste it. Um, legal. I want to go back to what Mr. Crouch just said. In 2018, the legal went up, I believe, 39.1%. I sent an email out to every county official. I think there's 362 to deny that budget. It went from 750000 to $1.1 million. If, I, if I'm wrong, go look it up. I'm off 100000 Forgive me. I don't know what the increase is from last year's budget looking at the current. But I can tell you, in the year they tried to keep the whistleblower document out of my hand, they spent almost $25,000 of the taxpayers' money suing the Attorney General. That's illegal. Well, to have Todd Clark conjure up a, a magical document, which I have the bill, is over $25,000. His travel one way, 2.8 hours is $937, one way. That's what we're getting for our legal. This is what the taxpayers are doing for this district. Why are we paying an attorney? Now, Mr. Tepper, I think, charges 66 bucks an hour to come from Round Rock. Why is this attorney charging full boat without supervision from the old favorite Gallegos and Walsh? Represents all these appraisal districts, part of our legal budget. Our legal budget needs audited every dime ever spent. What they'll do, they'll come in here and say, well, the average cost per hearing is X number of dollars, court cases, we have so many, this is how much money we need. We think so much more is gonna happen this year, so we need to increase. Well, I can tell you 25,000 with the top clerk. One way travel, $900. Now, where was that figured into the legal budget? So we have slop someplace. So Mr. Law, I'm not, I'm not, uh, Mr. Armstrong is still on record as being an employee. David Law was position wasn't filled for two years. We had an interim Debbie Cabello. She got an eye problem. She had to leave, <laughs> and now we got, um, which I like this guy over here. He was head of litigation. Now he's uh, head of commercial. So what are we going to do? We're going to let Armstrong's position fester for two years at 187,000 a year, plus benefits, and then mill that into the budget. Is that what you're all going to okay today? How many employees are working at TAD? And why did we approve 212 positions when there's only 197 for the entire year? Was it just to refund money to look good? I don't know. But you guys are the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett.
Um, oh, Chandler Crouch again. Morning board again. I really enjoy the opportunity to speak twice because then after I sit down, I think, man, I should have said this and this and this. I get a chance to weave it in here somehow. So this is a, on the budget. Um, it seems like one of the things that I was really encouraged by were some of the conversations that we had leading up to this meeting about some scrutiny on the budget and just want to take some steps to show the public that, hey, look, <clears throat> there are all sorts of things that people can be concerned about, whether it's how a TAD operates or whether it's the values or whatever whatever it is, um, but the budget is, is one thing that we can take a step on and show the public that we're going to take strides on this. Uh, and so uh, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, another thing is, uh, speaking about the budget and the budget specifically for the res residential department, which is who I have a uh, majority of my interaction in, on, I, I, I don't know how the day-to-day, -day, you know, like, demeanor of each employee is obviously because I'm not here all I can speak for is my experience and my experience was from the residential department uh, that it was uh, a, they were just very cooperative and did a great job uh, so for my interaction with the, the people there so that's money well spent um, and I can also say I've had experience with a tremendous amount of employees at TAD that are top level employees they're just excellent and then I also think there's probably a lot of people sitting around doing nothing when you have an organization of 200 people that always happens. It's like the 80-20, you've got some incredible employees, some employees doing nothing, and I probably don't get to talk to the ones doing nothing just because they're not doing anything. I don't know who those people are, but I just want to say the, the good behaviors, the good activity, the, the good employees, they have to be celebrated, they have to be acknowledged. That's one reason why I try and come up here and acknowledge the good and the bad, because anytime you've got, especially public perception, of something you got people upset about things they tend to just throw the baby out with the bathwater in an organization this size with the magnitude the importance of what you guys do um, there's a tremendous amount of people good people inside doing what they can to make this system as good as it can be and tad as good as it can be and so um, you know so there's money well spent in, in certain areas and I'm glad I'm really glad y'all are taking the time to uh, scrutinize where the money is being spent um, I think um, Let's see, I, I want to mention this. If there's ever something going on here at TAD that you have a question about, as the board, just like me, y'all have more information than I have in certain aspects because of the nature of protesting for so many. I have some experience y'all don't have. Um, <coughs> neither one of us get to see what happens behind these walls. We just get the information we have that's been given to us. Um, but something that is a, uh, often misunderstood is that is the extent of the authority that you guys have I've emailed everybody except for uh, Mr. Puente because just with your uh, you know, just getting on the board but um, there's a provision of the tax code it's a uh, 6.05 C that allows you guys to take any issue you want and make it require board approval so while the intent of this board is to um, just deal with high level decisions if at any time there's something that concerns you and you want to get a peek of something going on behind the walls or a specific item on the budget that you have further questions about it's within your authority to do that and I just want to point it out because the tax code's complicated every time I read it I find something new in there and so 6.05 C is something there um, I wonder if there's an opportunity to save money by utilize, utilizing the volunteer work of people like Mr. Dodson that's on numerous occasions come to the board and offered his assistance I know that there's got to be some qualifications uh, maybe that he would have to pass to give privy him to certain um, information being an elected official I think he's about to term out thank you for your service by the way really appreciate it uh, re re agree with him or not he's willing to stand up and be a leader and say things and that a lot of people might be thinking or might not be thinking might disagree with him but he's willing to stand up and say things that take courage so I appreciate that anyway uh, I wonder if there's any opportunity to utilize uh, volunteer work from people like that that are that have a high degree of interest in, in this organization and what's going on here and the values and, and the effect that we have on the public. Um, I just thought that might be something to consider. So anyway, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crox. Uh, Lucila Seri. 
Good morning, Good morning. Lucy Lasseri from North Arlington. So, Chairman Porpa, Pompa, board members, I'm here to discuss the matter of the budget. First of all, I want to give kudos to Mr. Puente in the last meeting for shaving that budget increase by 1%. But the interesting part that, that that discussion took place in like five minutes. So you guys would be interested in what happened after close session. A lot of good things happen. So that clearly shows that there's more room to shave in this budget, more considering things mentioned by Mr. Bennett. What is the actual count of employees that we have? We have no transparency. So how can we approve budget increases under an institution that we have no transparency and trust on. You guys need to fix your issues and you need to tie your belt with the employees you have. I run a team of engineers and I'm not getting more people for 2024. I'm getting less. Corporate America is tied in their belt. You guys should be doing the same and not just approving things carte blanche. Mm -hmm. Another thing, how much are we spending? All, all of these employees that come and compliment, are they on the clock? Feels like, is that part of the department marketing initiative, having employees coming and speaking kudos on the meeting? Other things on contracts. We need to go to the best contract, not benefit friends and families. For example, what happened with that contract for the exemptions that was supposed to be 300K contract, but then you guys wanted to go with a 2.2 million one for the same services? You guys need to spend like you spend in your houses. We are all suffering this economy, and all you guys to do is raise and raise and raise. The appraisal, maybe we appraise less, we wouldn't have to pay for the many employees. Chairman Pompa, something to consider for the next appraisal plan, as we are only supposed to appraise by law once every three years at a minimum, not once every year as we're doing. So have we considered trying to type, try to be more inventive? I have to make my employees start working cross streams as to minimize the workload. Have we been trying that? I don't think so. So I would like to see another reduction on this tax rate. I would like a no new revenue tax rate. I don't know if you guys have a, like a zero increase tax rate. Why do we keep increasing? Maybe, Mr. Law, the answer is for you to go. Since you're here, IT expenses, legal expenses are rampaging. Why are we keeping friends that are not benefiting the districts? You guys respond to us. You represent us. I'm sorry if it's gonna mean that you're not invited to Mr. Law's barbecue, but you need to work for us. That letter of intention, that was issued in April. You were supposed to have a decision by July. Here we are, August, and another closed session with that justification. That letter of intention does give you a lot of justification to go into closed sessions, right? Transparency, again. It doesn't take money to be transparent. Actually, you can be more transparent cutting money than increasing it. Mm -hmm. So, well, I think I covered it. But I want to make a comment. I was pleasantly surprised by when I went to do my board, the appraiser, mm, but the person that I was defending to, she was a very lovely lady. So Mr. Mrs. Betsy Price, she was a darling. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harry. And that concludes our speakers that signed up to speak on the public uh, comments. I mean, I'm sorry, on the budget. Did I miss anybody? Okay, well, thank you to all our speakers. We appreciate you taking the time of your day to come and speak with us uh, this morning. Uh, we're gonna move on to action items. Okay, so uh, so we're officially closing the budget hearing. As no other comments, is that all? Okay. Alrighty. Okay, so we'll move into action items. Um, the consent agenda, uh, which includes our uh, minutes for June 9th, 2023, um, action re regarding award of contract for retiree group medical supplemental insurance for 2024 
and to authorize the chief appraiser to execute an interlocal agreement renewal between Tarrant County and the Tarrant Appraisal District for Sheriff's Department Security Services. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. I would like to have one item removed, sir. Yes. For discussion, item number two. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Move approval of the remainder of the consent agenda. We have a, a motion. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <clears throat> okay. Then uh, we'll go ahead and start with uh, 7A2, the action wording, uh, regarding award of contract for retiree group medical uh, supplemental insurance. Uh, do you have something for us on that, Mr. Craig? Yeah, give me a moment here. Um, so, first of all, please give me leeway in the fact that, again, newest member in every meeting I'm learning and everything I, I looked into this, I basically only had a few days to look into it, much less run my business, so uh, please consider that. And she might. Oh, well, okay. Um, so, last, last meeting I was... I, I couldn't even repeat exactly what was said, but I was amazed at something in reference. Am I on? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, about how gracious our retirement benefits are, and I think they're outstanding. Now, I also find that I work, uh, I'm on the uh, Texas uh, Finance Commission of Texas, and their benefits are incredible. And so state and government uh, retirement benefits just seem pretty Im impressive. I know that in my business, I can't possibly uh, compete with that type of thing, yet we have to for employees. So when I saw this, I was surprised, uh, to say the least, that this is a benefit that we're offering. Uh, and so essentially, if I have it correctly, that if a person retires officially from TAD, then they're no longer an employee of TAD, but then we issue either cash or pay a, uh, the benefit of insurance for them. And so in this case, we're being asked to uh, budget $120, no, well, we're actually asked to budget $150 of 102 possible persons that can retire in 2024. Not all of them will retire, but that's possible. And some, then if I got my numbers right, there's something about there's 79 that we think will retire. And there's, and instead of 150, we can get the, the policy for $120 and three cents. And so again, in a nutshell, if I have this correctly, whether it's 79 or whether it's 102, if they are retired, we start issuing, if they ask for it, uh, $120 per month, um, you know, which is about just under $1,500 a year to a non-employee. Now they already have a retirement program. They have all the benefits of that. And then this is on top of it. Uh, there's no, as far as I can tell, any state requirement for this, uh, nor in our policy, if I, again, didn't study the entire policy, uh, we, we, the requirement is we must offer the ability for this, to have this insurance, but there is no policy or state requirement that we pay them uh, the benefit of that. And so as we're, we're hearing, again, the public is very concerned about it. Um, governments running wild with expenses. Uh, their inflation's rising, their <laughs> homeowner property taxes are going up, although again, well, hopefully we'll see relief from that soon because the state legislature. But all these ex gasoline's going, everything's going up, and yet they're not necessarily getting paid to go up. And so what, what's our role in this? Our role is, the more efficiently we can run this organization, if we can cut $100,000 here or $200,000 there, well, in 10 years, that's $2 million in that case. So it all adds up. So again, I appreciate the people that work here. I appreciate the fact that they retired here. I believe if they only work here eight years they, and they reach 65, they can retire. Uh, but to go on and continue to give a, a, an additional cash benefit seems a little out of whack for me. Um, so I, 
I am, I have a motion here, but I, I think we should we want to have a discussion first. But essentially, I, I've got my offer is to discontinue the program over a, a four or five year period. Uh, not so that it's not an instant shock, but I don't see why we need to give this additional benefit. Uh, again, from a budget standpoint, uh, right now the budget is $188,000 for one year and 10 years, uh, that's nearly $2 million. So that's, that's my discussion part of it and go from there. Jeff, you want to speak yeah, to that? I, th I, think I, I think I can and, and Mr. Craig can as well. Um, this, this is basically a Medicare supplement plan. Yes, I understand it's, that. It's not to all, anyone that retires. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm not 65 yet. If I, if I were to choose to retire, I wouldn't actually get this benefit until I would reach age 65. Which is what I said. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, is we don't actually budget the $150 per employee. We actually budget the actual cost, which is going to be around. Right it's time for the budget workshop. We have the we didn't know. Yeah, we didn't know what that was. So That's what right. I've been presenting, it looks like $150. Okay, okay. But regardless, uh, whether it's 150 or 120 my concern is this, certainly. this additional benefit. And, and this, is, this is something that has come up before the board before in the past uh, several years, actually. I, I came in 2008, and this was, a, this was a program that was in place prior to, prior to my arrival. And we had many conversations about uh, this. It's actually written in our po uh, policy manual that the board of directors does have to review this annually. And at one point in time, there was other boards that were discussing the same thing that you're bringing up today about whether or not we should continue it or, or you know, terminate it. Uh, we went and sought legal counsel on it and hired, a, hired an attorney to, to research it and look at into it. And the, the advice we got there was that, yes, the board could, can, could cancel it um, because it's not necessarily, and I'll let Jeff talk about the, the legal issues over there. but. The attorney at that particular time gave us advice from a standpoint that said but you should be careful because there are uh, employees that are retirees out there that saw this as a perceived benefit that was offered by the appraisal district and they could turn around and sue you on it and say no this was this wasn't a benefit that I was entitled to and the other was that if you have employees that are nearing retirement or thinking about retirement but haven't pulled that trigger and this is something that they're looking at also as a perceived benefit the advice we got from legal counsel was you, you probably will get sued and there's a good chance that the courts may come back and order you to say because you've offered this benefit for so long that it's now almost like an implied benefit that exists that's there's no decision that's been made on that and that the board at that particular time decided to go ahead and continue Jeff do you want to add more to the technical side yeah, of that I, I could, I, I, Or for the television audience, okay. the, the live feed. Sorry about that. Jeff Craig, Director of Administration. Uh, I was looking back at uh, past notes and records from when this had come up before, and it looks like the last time that the board had really discussed this was in 2015. And so we had done some research at that time about the history of this benefit. It, it is, we are required to offer a benefit, uh, the Texas Local Government Code. Uh, requires that we offer coverage. We uh, offer access. Yeah. Correct. Well, I, I can read it to you if, if you want to hear the language in it. But, uh, but that's what I took from the language. Yeah. Um, uh, the person may elect to cover the same persons who are covered under the county's or municipal mi municipalities group health insurance plan or group health coverage plan through the person at the time the person left county or municipal employment or the person may elect to discontinue coverage for one or more persons. A person who was not covered under the plan at the time the person to whom this chapter applies left county or municipal employment is not eligible for coverage under this chapter, except as provided by subsection C and D. The level of coverage provided under this chapter at any given time is the same level of coverage provided to current employees of the county or municipality at that time. A county or municipality may substitute a Medicare supplement health benefits coverage as the coverage provided for the person who receives health benefits covered under this chapter, including the dependent under the, uh, after the date that the person becomes eligible for federal Medicare benefits, the person may elect to continue coverage at a reduced level if offered by the county municipality. When I, when I look back at the history here, originally they had just, uh, 
allowed retirees to stay on the group health plan and paid for that. That was the, the plan, but they did switch to this Medicare supplement. Uh, and I think it was around 1998 or 1999, somewhere in that, that, that timeframe. Um, and so the policy has been in place for, for a good while. We did in 2015, the board was, well, 2012, we've talked about this cap of 150. At 2012, the uh, GASB rule changes, GASB 45, uh, Government Accounting Standard Board uh, practices, um, required that government entities start um, reporting the liability of uh, other post-employment benefits. And so for the first time, that liability shows up on the <clears throat> balance sheet, basically. Excuse me. So the, the board at that time was, was really trying to, to find a way to reduce the liability. Actually, they wanted to do away with the liability. If they could reduce it to zero, that's what they wanted to do. So they had us go out and find out what could we do to either reduce it to zero or reduce that liability. We went to our actuarials, Milliman, and said, what are the, what are the options? Well, the, the first option to reduce it to zero was to stop the program, just, just stop it, and that would, it would go to zero. Um, and so that would be one option. Uh, then there were other options beyond that. Um, so I know at the time we, we did talk to um, our insurance consultants, talked to a labor lawyer about, okay, what, what's kind of the, the repercussions from that? And at that time, uh, that's when we were told, well, it, you, you may have very well created a, um, an implied benefit because you've offered this for so long and that people have assumed that in their, their calculations. And so they said that there's a pretty high chance that you would, you'd have a, li a legal liability for that uh, and recommended we not do that. So at that time, the board decided to look at another option. The, the next best option to reduce the liability immediately uh, not to zero, but to reduce liability was to put some cap on the on the payment, and that's when the payments were capped at the hundred fifty dollars. In 2015, we looked at this again. The board wanted to look at it again, and I, I'm just looking at my notes from that. Uh, and at that same time, we received advice from our insurance consultants and a labor lawyer that, as a result of our practice of doing this consistently over the years, we may have created a perceived benefit and have some legal exposure if we were to stop providing it. So. I, I know that at that time the board um, decided that they uh, did not want to have that exposure. And what, what year was that? 2015. 2015. Uh, yeah, and I want to I want to correct my statement. That's that's what I was intending to point out was that that the previous boards had looked at it, and I don't know that I said it as eloquently as Mr. Craig just did. So so let me address the. Um, and again, <laughs> I'm no lawyer, obviously, but the. You know, this is local government code chapter 175, but it's it's pretty plain. So the the, the heading of it reads: Chapter 175, right of employees of certain political subdivisions to purchase continued health coverage at retirement, and that's what the entire document is about. And it goes on to say, um, next page, well, at least in my print. A person from this, uh, whom this chapter applies to, is entitled to purchase continued health benefits. And then later on, it talks about prohibit a political subdivision from agreeing with a person to pay for the coverage provided from this, uh, provided the person reimburses the political subdivision. Uh, and it goes on and on. I mean, it's clear the the, the code clearly is referring to the employee. Yes, we must offer the benefit but it is clear that it is a benefit that they purchase and it's their option. Uh, so I'm only addressing the fact that, as you said, we may be sued. Again, I'm not an attorney. I'm a businessman running businesses and understand how budgets work, I understand how costs work, I understand about the responsibility to my employees that I've got to make a profit in order to pay them and continue their wages. And on the other hand, I understand the fact that as years I've been to my employees, such as uh, last year, and tell my management, no raises for you, but we're going to raise the uh, uh, staff in order to keep them competitive. And so again, uh, yeah, this is a liability. Um, it's like it's, it is a, and, and as you described, it's a liability. 
it's an ongoing cost that can increase. And on a side note, I point out, if, if the notes I received were correct, this coming year we have 102 people, I guess, that reach the age of 65, because what I was sent was 102 people will be eligible. Not all of them are going to retire, so they're not, and then again, apparently we, we think 79 are. So on a side note, 102 out of 210 employees you better be imagine we're gonna have a big turnover in the next several years yeah. so that's a side note I that we've got to address yeah. There, maybe yeah, yeah. That, the 102 yeah, includes that current retirees that have been retired so it's yeah. okay it's again all, that wasn't it's all retirees and any that could also okay be retired. just so for clarification i'm going off yeah. the, the the notes i received just for clarification the 79 is our current number of retirees yeah. That, that's how many yeah. that are currently receiving this benefit that have retired from TAD already. Is that, that I'm I think that's, asking that, for I confirmation. Think that correct. Okay. Yeah. But you know, we have people that retired during the year. We have unfortunately have retirees that passed away during the year, so those numbers fluctuate. Change. They fluctuate. But again, my my, I, I guess what I see here, it's an opportunity to lower TAD's cost on an on, for a lifetime going on, unless we bring it back. And our retirement benefits are ex extremely healthy, extremely competitive in my mind anyway, and very, very beneficial to the people. So yes, we need to provide them access to the Medicare, to the insurance, but I don't see why we're cutting checks. And again, when we cut the check, it's really that person's, there's no accountability whether they spend that on Medicare or not, or on the insurance or not. And I understand, it looks like about roughly half or we're cutting checks to and roughly half we're, we're administrating their insurance which is another cost can, can I can I speak to that part of it because that my, my preference would always be that we just buy, uh, pay for the supplement for everybody but when uh, when they first went to this Medicare supplement from the regular insurance not every not every retiree was able to get coverage under that Medicare supplement so in other words, a retiree may have moved to Arkansas or moved, you know, somewhere else, and they weren't qualified in the coverage area of the supplement at the time. Which is so that was a problem then. So, which and is again beyond what the law is asking. Yeah, but I'm just do. saying that that the reason for that cash payment to begin with was just to compensate those members who couldn't literally be in the program to be able to find their own coverage, and that went on for a while. But it, it's just now at the point where coverages are much more universal and policies we can get now more than likely will cover all of them but that practice of allowing them to take that option to get their own some may want to get a richer Medicare plan than what we offer um, we don't offer the richest um, so that's you know those are those options out there I my my personal preference and just from an ease of, of uh, administration would be that we just have everybody on our Medicare supplement and we don't pay those cash payments but that's that's been that that practice is one of those things that would just um, yeah and, and again to this, change that. this very conversation that we're having here today or this the same exact conversations that we had in 2012 and 2015 because boards were asking that same that same question that you're asking yeah. today okay. and our policy does say that we have to bring this back to you every year for you to consider it and then again it's just the board weighing all of those things weighing the cost weighing the legal liability and, and that type of thing can can I add one more thought too because we I, you guys will remember well not not all of you remember this because not everybody was on the board at the time but um, last year multiple times we brought up a possible retiree benefit that would allow for folks that had reached maybe like the age of 60 that were within five years of retirement uh, to be able to retire early, which in our mind would give probably a higher payroll off, you know, a higher salary off the payroll. Um, and then we would pay for their group insurance until they turn 65 or eligible for this program. And one of the things that um, we, we thought was that that would be, you know, kind of a motivation to keep people here, um, at least till 60 or whatever that age would be. And I, I remember, Mr. Papa, your, your concern about that was the loss of institutional knowledge of, of some of those folks that might be leaving at, at that age. Well, part of what I think keeps folks here in those last several years of their good working career is 
you know, understanding that this will be the benefit they'll receive when they get to 65. So just when we're thinking about how what the impact of this will be in terms of that that concept of perceived benefit where people have been kind of counting on this or this has been part of their um, kind of their long-term calculations or planning um, I think I think we're going to have a bunch of folks that won't be uh, be impacted by that any other discussion over here on this that I have <clears throat> let me clarify in my own mind to make sure I, I understand under 65 they're still on the group plan yes at their cost and if, at if 65 they, they convert to Medicare and what is what is the OPEB reduction by doing that the, okay, have, have you run the it. have you run the calculation on OPEB the uh, uh, other, post, other post after employment yeah yeah that that's that calculation is run every year on the in the audit so it, it shows up in the audit as but a, line a reduction there. in I mean it, it, the option would be to do nothing or to continue on the group plan if you don't convert to Medicare yeah oh well uh, yes yeah, no I, th I, I don't think, think I, I don't think I give you that answer sitting here today I know, but I, I, know, I think but I think I understand what you're saying uh, and, ju and just to clarify for folks that do retire earlier than 65 to be able to get to this benefit they've got to stay on our group plan at their cost through those years so if someone were to retire at 60 they would have to stay on our group plan for five years to be able to get to that 65 that's our, our, our group plan is probably going to be fairly expensive for them to do that but that's a that's a commitment they would make but you're self-insured under the group plan uh, the group plan would yeah. be well we're, we're not we're not self-insured self -insured, but, but yeah, we're, yeah and I think another point too is that if you're under the age of 65 and as long as you're employed here you're on our group plan and and we, the only people who I think correct me if I'm wrong Jeff the only people who can stay on the group plan <coughs> past age 65 is if you're if you remain an employee right in other words you work to your 70 you can yeah. still get health benefit. but if you retire at 60 and then you pay you pay the premiums to stay on the group plan once you're 65 you you come off of our group plan and you go on to Medicare is that correct that's correct and then you would have this supplemental uh, Medicare plan that's available uh, no we are not well, on no, Social we, Security we don't just that's Social that's Security. you know yes the appraisal district does not pay Social Security so no no employee from the appraisal district will see social security benefits from the social security administration now you may have worked for another entity that did it and you might be able to get social security benefits from a previous employer but not from tad tad your retirement will be well, because we have a separate retirement yes system. we have we have a separate retirement system and that will be your retirement from tad yeah it, it might be helpful in, in mr pointy I, I appreciate your you're asking the right question, but what you need to see, I think, is the OPEB reduction, the OPEB, the OPEB calculation. What are the other post-employment benefits, and what is the reduction by doing this? Are you are you reducing the liability? Well, we reduced the liability tremendously yeah. whenever we put the one, when the board implemented that we would pay no more than one hundred and fifty dollars per month per that, per retired employee. That's the question. That I'm like asking. That, yeah. I want to say that cut it about in half, didn't if you, it? Yeah, it cut it. Uh, it was the most dramatic of the options. They gave us about five options, I think, four or five options, and the capping should, was the you should have other than doing away with it. Capping was the yeah. the most most uh, effective. impactful. But you should have that calculation to show at the time that it was originally done what the reduction in the OPEP was. Yeah. Uh, Is, and, isn't and that should be done by Milliman? Milliman, the actuarials. Yeah, actuarials. Uh, and that would have been when that was actually that study was done. That was 2012. So, you know, it would be um, wouldn't so completely germane. It to would be helpful. dollars, but yeah, yeah. So let me um, kind of bring this together. Um, Are you done? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I. Okay. Again, I, I, I appreciate all the retirees. I want them to have good benefits. I, it, it sounds to me like, from what I, a little bit of exposure I have to, we have a great plan for them, uh, and that's awesome. This is above and beyond that, in my my viewpoint. It's beyond what the what the code asks us to do, clearly, and I think that's 
again, not being an attorney, I think that's clearly defensible. Um, so let me go ahead and make my motion, because my motion also has another part to it that I think will, will help in this. Uh, and again, it eliminates the liability, because there's risk, and it just flat saves money to this organization, which eventually, we hope, saves money for the taxpayer. So I move that we, that we discontinue this program in fiscal 2024 with a ramp down of the, of the benefits. That ramp down would be take the base and we reduce the base by 20% this year, which is $120, or we just go ahead and pay, we're, we're paying 100% of this year. So no immediate uh, uh, penalty to, the, to those that are used to getting it. Then we reduce the base another or down 60%, which means it's $90 in 2025, then it's $60 in 2026, it's $30 in 2027, and in 2028 it's off our books. So it's a very kind ramp down. It has, they get 100% this year uh, anyway, and everyone knows that it's gonna ramp down. So that is my motion. Just one, I guess, clarification on that from the legal. Can can we um, assume or force future boards to a certain action that we choose? So, for example, if we put that on the books this year, would a board next year, when this comes before the board, say, we just want to get rid of it altogether already, or? Let's, we got too much pressure from the people and we want to go back to what it was before. How does that work for future boards? Obviously, you all set the budget and made the decisions. But we're, you can only set the budget for this year. Right. This is the... Two years or beginning of next year, if there's a, uh, a new set of board elections, if that board wants to do something different, um, they can go ahead and do it. Uh, you can obviously, you can set a policy and a direction and uh, imagine that y'all entering like some contracts that are more than two year contracts but those contracts always have in them provisions that allow a future board to get out of it. So you couldn't buy the 25, 26, 27, and 28 boards, um, and if they chose to do something so, Yeah, just so you're clear on that. Okay. Idea. Thank you. Matt. Any other discussion? Well, uh, are you going to ask for a second? Well, can I, before you, let's, can you, let's, can you say what, that motion? I mean, I, okay. I missed the, if, I missed the percentages. Since you have it printed out, do you have copies for everybody since you brought it printed? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, okay. Because I have other notes on here, but, um, but it, actually, can, this could be duplicated. So, uh, Wendy, if someone wants to make copies of this, this could be, could be duplicated. It's got some other notes that are relative, but I'm fine with that. So, you want to make copies of that for us? Oh, everybody have. I changed it just slightly. I just couldn't write as fast as you were I talking. couldn't either. <laughs> okay. So, let me make one change here. <clears throat> Probably not the best English. Want to repeat it again, or wait for just bring it back? I guess I guess we can wait. I mean, well, it, it, um, if you want to repeat it, so we can get a second. Okay. I move that we discontinue this uh, discontinue this program in fiscal 2024 with a ramp down of the of the benefits, and then I'd say the, the ramp down. That's what I was needing. Okay. So in 2025, so you take the bait. What we're going to do is ramp down the base. Okay. We ramp it down to 80% in 2024 for now, this fiscal year, which takes it to $120, or I would say $120.03 to cover okay. that, that 100, the 100%. Then the base goes to $90. Or 60%. 60% of the 150. And 25. And then, then 60, then 30, and then zero. 60, 30, and that would be 2026. 20, so I'm, I'm open to that part. You're saying get to 0% in 2027? 20, 28. 28. 28 is 0. Here you go. What was 2027? 
24 is 120, 25 is 90, 60, 30, okay. zero. I, I got it now. Do we, do we have a second for that motion? Okay, we have a second. Uh, any further discussion? Any other comments, questions? You wanna wait for the paper to come back? I have a question. We have differing numbers. Uh, the first year, is it 80 or is it 90? Because we wrote down two different things. Okay. So we have differing. So 2024 is the base would become 120. That's probably a better way of saying it. 2025, the base would become 90. 26, 60, 27, 30, 28, 0. Thank you, Ms. Waddell. I think that's where I got confused. You switch from percentages to yeah. numbers. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's better to say base. Yeah, okay. That, well, that's I much have clearer. Base, just... oh, thank you. Could, uh, could, could, could you modify that just about one thing? So, so for 2024, you're saying 120. That would mean we would have to bill everybody for 30 cents a month. Well, and I said we verbally okay. yeah. that we would actually pay 100% in that case. Okay, okay. I was sure the no, math I got there, but yeah. I do intend that if it is 120, $120.30, yeah. that we'd pay 100% of that. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, we have no more questions or comments. Um, I have. Just one uh, question, I guess. What about, uh, you know, we get sued all the time, so I'm not, but I don't necessarily want to, <laughs> you know, encourage, actively encourage any lawsuits. Um, trying to think of a way that we can get some advice from a, an attorney on this. Matthew, this may be beyond your scope since it's more labor law. What are your thoughts on it? Um, I work with one other appraisal district that did this, that went ahead and discontinued. Uh, they did exactly so most appraisal districts have something like this? Well, I, some do, some don't. Okay. I, I know of one appraisal district that I work with that had the program. They did pay it. Mr. Fuente's right. It is not required that the appraisal district pay for it. And when they did go ahead and removed it. Um, they did not do a ramp down on it. They just cut it out. Uh, they did get sued by their, their former employees who were already retired, and they did lose that lawsuit and ultimately had to had to do something to pay those employees and continue the ones that were already on the benefit and already retired to continue paying that benefit for them. So it sounds like perhaps uh, a safer uh, approach may be to leave the people that are already retired and have already had that agreement and expectation that way but future retirees either not offer it at all or offer the ramp down plan or, or something like that uh, just just for a point of discussion here to try to uh, protect the district from unnecessary legal expenses which is at the end of the day is what it is if we make judgments or decisions that are automatically going to cause us lawsuits, you know, then we have to, you know, be aware of that. Again, we get sued all the time. We have attorneys on, on, on staff, but I'd rather not give people more reason to do it. Um, Jeff, well, Jeff, I, Jeff I has know, a comment. I know that timing is critical as far as we've got to commit to the policy. Mm -hmm. We've got to have a, a yes or no, you know, for the Blue Cross Blue Shield. If, if we're going to commit to the cost for this year or say this is that first year could could we take that action and then have a plan of contacting a labor lawyer to get some, not, not some good advice about what whether to continue grandfathering in folks and all these things you're trying to consider bring it back would, yeah. you, would it be better to I, I have mean, time to get some good advice on that we've got a little bit of real world experience sitting near right there well, and it sounds I, like there's a lot of precedent too yeah yeah so uh you're talking uh, the lawsuits came from people who were already retired yes okay I'm, i would suggest i think that's a good point mr chairman and and if um if mr puente would accept it as a friendly amendment that we uh, maintain um, the status quo for people who are already retired 
as of today. Um, but the policy go into effect for any future retirement. Let, let me throw out for not for consideration if, from that amendment. I I like the idea. I think you're right, Tony. I think you're right. Keep it with existing people, and then eventually that liability does go away. But then I would say then let's terminate any, immediately, and we stop the liability at this point. So no ramp down. We just stop it from this point, but we continue with the ones that are already retired. So that would an amendment I would take. Um, I, 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 yes, go ahead. I've got, got a couple okay. of hands up here. <laughs> um, I've got a tab on the shoulder from for, the so I can yeah. look at this way. I'm familiar with the, the, and I'm not an attorney, didn't sleep in a Holiday Inn. And, <laughs> uh, uh, well, I did both. <laughs> okay, okay. So he's on his point today. I, I am today. familiar with uh, what the Constitution, state Constitution, says about removing benefits once they're in place. So I'm going to withdraw my second only because of the legal considerations. And I would ask that in our next, it, it's a budget item uh, that, that we have to act on the budget today from a policy perspective. I would ask you to come back in our next meeting to present the policy issue and the legal issue uh, going forward. So, okay, well, so we, I withdraw. We, we, we got a lot going on here. We maybe uh, a friendly amendment that sounds like it's accepted, but now we've lost a second. Uh, do you want to restate the motion? Yeah. Why don't you withdraw your original motion, restate, uh, make a new motion with what we've sort of kind of yeah seem to be in line with and then uh we can get a second and a vote on that would, right. would, you, would you be okay with that yes sir that'd be great okay so i withdraw my motion but i'd like to make a, make a motion instead that uh, i'm going to ramble but my motion would be to continue the program with existing people already receiving the benefit but effective 2024 the program is removed for any future retirees okay uh any questions on the wording, and do we have a second on that? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, so this he's comes got into a, yes. my question here. Okay. Of course, you know, I know mm -hmm. we, we've been several not attorneys here. So my question for you, Matthew, is, okay, we know that current retirees will continue in on the program. And if we were to do away with it, the potential lawsuits coming from them, what about current employees that are close to it or on it or you know they've been counting on that they've, they've been told that they're going to receive this is that a potential lawsuit there it's certainly a potential one um, i think uh, the phrase i've heard uh, is a perceived benefit or an implied benefit um, and that would be what the claim is obviously the closer somebody is to retirement uh, the better the chance that claim has of being successful somebody that's still a long ways away from it probably doesn't have a very good claim on it at all um, the one case that I know of it was brought by people that were already retired and were receiving the benefit and so how it would end up as far as somebody that was you know 64 and a half and was planning on retiring sometime next year uh, sitting here right now I, I couldn't really offer you a very good opinion of that uh, but I can I certainly look And I like his, his emphasis on the word perceived and maybe, and we might get sued, you know, um, unless state employees have more rights to sue than my business employees, uh, there's always that chance. I mean, we got, you know, we, we've been to court ourselves and, and we've won some, we've lost some, and we've lost some when we were, we believe we were right. But, um, you know, given notice, I love the fact that leave it with the ones they are, given notice with existing ones, we eliminate the life, we eventually eliminate the liability from future boards, future taxpayers. Um, and again, as far as what the, the code says, it's very clear. There's, this is a benefit on top of that. We have very generous retirement benefits now. And um, I, 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 matter of fact, my employees, Every three months we decide, no, I'm sorry, every six months we decide whether what our match is going to be on the 401k, depending on what the, the business environment is. And so 
things change all the time. Again, I think this government thing, it's not our money, it's not even TAD's money, it's the entity's money, which is the taxpayer's money. It's easy to raise budgets, it's easy to spend money. I'm not saying we're doing that unwisely, but I'm just saying it's easy and we are always concerned about lawsuits, but you know, I don't have a lawyer on staff and, and yet I think we do. So. Jeff had a comment or a question or did you did you were you gonna make a comment? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. okay. Well, I have Thank a quick you. question. Um, I have a quick question just so that we know what we're talking about just this year. So this is this year's budget, right? We, we, we've said the people that are already getting it are going to continue to get it. So that's an expense already recognized. But how many people do you think may you would expect to retire this year? Oh, to retire this year? Well, we we know that we've got 79 active and we've got 102 potentials, so there's that number really between the 79. So 23. Yeah, something in that, that so, arrangement there. They're well, already, that would be people that are already 65 and could retire. Yeah. So that's, uh, then that at 150, that's 23 times 150,000. We're talking about $35,000 yeah. uh, roughly uh, we, in savings we, for this year. Don't we currently have like four or five that are kind of already in the pipeline that yeah. have announced yeah, that's, there that that's they are retiring? Correct. So let's say five for sure yeah. that, you know, uh, we would save the money on. So that's $7,500 yeah, $7, a month. Yeah. And then potentially maybe up to we're saving for the year, whatever. The, so what is, what is that, I guess, what is that I, guess I, I didn't really have a comment, but a question. So are we... Are we saying that a January 1, 2024 date is the the date this would go into effect, which would give folks that are thinking about it? Yeah, because we're talking about the 2025 budget, 2024 budget. I'm sorry. The budget takes effect January 1, 2024. So it'd be January 1. Yeah. So so be, whoever hire, retires between now and that time frame, they still retire under the current system. Yeah. If and they anyone retired, that, anyone that retires under what the policy is now, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll need to make a policy change as well because mm -hmm. the policy's mm -hmm. specific as to what what the so, benefit is. So just just run those numbers for the, all 23 people that could retire today. And say if if we get, do away with that liability, because it's not a true expense until it happens. It's just a right. liability right now. So it's not a budget item, although. We recognize it as a liability. It's about forty-one thousand dollars. Forty-one thousand dollars for four hundred dollars. Yes, Julie, do you have a? So really, one twenty is what we're saved. What our true cost is. One twenty per month, right? Yes. Times twenty-three times twelve. It's fourteen forty. So it's thirty-three thousand one hundred and twenty if they all took it. So all you know, we're we're having this conversation. The impact of the budget may be around thirty-three thousand dollars. So, would it be would it be simple to say that anyone who retired under the current policy, written policy, prior to that January one date, would this would qualify? Well, well, this policy would take effect. We're voting on the budget, and this policy is associated. If that's January yeah, first, we'll, yeah, we'll, so we'll, that gives you even more buffer. Sure. Uh, and, and we'll need to put that new policy in place. If it passes, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, uh, uh, and I, I mean, I, I think, uh, and I, I wanted to put the numbers out there so we, we know how much money we're talking about. And frankly, you know, thirty thousand dollars is a lot of money to you, me, but as part of our budget, it's a small amount. And for the for liability the future, it might create, I don't know if I'd like but that. For the future, we are talking a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. So again, we're, we're, we're not here just deciding for today. We're trying to decide for the future although it could be changed by a different board. Okay, so we have a first, we have a second. Any other, oh, yeah. sorry? Yep. And, and just a note, and I'm not, yeah, again, I'm not an accountant, uh, but you do an annual financial audit, and in that audit, you've got to report your OPEB liability. And this, uh, albeit minor, is a, a reduction of the liability that would show under the Gatsby rules. Okay. I have um, just some observations as I've been listening to the great discussion here. Um, I've been an engineer and sometimes land developer for almost 40 years and I've seen some economic cycles. Benefits that were uh, changed after 
the 87 crash, for instance, or 9-11, or um, 2008, or COVID, people's benefits get changed in those times. And I don't think, as I think about what somebody who's already receiving the benefit against somebody who would receive it later, I don't think we're committing um, because we're voting on whether or not 150 or 100 and twenty dollars and thirty cents those are variable numbers and, and I don't see how we can be obligated to that amount they still have access to this program I think is what mr. Puente is pointing out and I agree with him so um, I think in the big picture this is a reasonable um, change that protects existing benefits to existing retirees and um, I would support the motion as uh, mr. Puente, Puente offered it Yes. Final thoughts on this uh, would just be, and you guys have uh, brought up some great points, and I'll just round it out with something small. Uh, absolutely, it is uh, getting rid of an expense for our upcoming year and for future years, and absolutely, we want to be great stewards uh, of the taxpayer dollars. Uh, for sure. Uh, this is an opportunity for um, a retirement flood before the end of the year uh, for those that might be considering it, but they might do that anyway, you know, so uh, that's, we're, we're not going to be creating it. COVID helped people make that decision also. So uh, very, you know, not, not similar to this, this vote. Uh, but We've also discussed the institutional knowledge that uh, these folks that uh, may be retiring, they've been in these positions and they have this institutional knowledge that they've held and would be walking out the door. Well, when they retire, it's going to leave anyway. Yeah. You know, so we, we, I do understand that, you know, but uh, just bringing that to the forefront, uh, not as a negative, not as a positive, just as a discussion point uh, for everyone to, uh, to think about, you know, as we are being great stewards of uh, the taxpayer dollars, and uh, because we brought up uh, potential of uh, legal uh, issues, you know, I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't echo uh, and remember the the concepts that the speakers brought up. You know, uh, it was uh, curbing the legal spending. You know, well, we need to make sure that we're not uh, we're not bringing forth items that are going to add great legal costs, you know, as well. So uh, so I did hear you and uh, it did ring true in some of the comments. So uh, so I heard you and thank you. Uh, those are my comments on this item. Thank you. I think it's time to vote. So, um, oh, Jeff. Just one, I'll, what, whatever the motion ends up being, I just wanted to uh, be sure we could just clarify so that we don't have any issues. Are we, are we saying that anyone that retires under the current policy between now and December 31st that's that is the policy still and then we'll have to look at changing that policy Correct. for January 1 going forward which will take out the description of how yep. it's done now yes and on that note <clears throat> I got handed up I didn't the policy and the I didn't think the policy referred to Adult, well, maybe there's a separate section, but it refers to that we provide the access to the Medicare, but I didn't think it said, stated that we providing an actual dollar benefit in the policy. I'm not saying it's not the policy of this board, but as far as the <coughs> hand manual the employees, I don't. Yeah, is I it don't, a policy or just an employment uh, agreement? No, it's not, a, it's not an employment agreement. We don't have any contractual agreements with employees at all. The, I don't think it's in the policy manual that no. we're issuing money. So I no, think I think it actually is. If I don't have the policy manual in front of me, but I thought we do have something in the personnel policy. Okay. Said Let me recognize we, Matthew. He's got if, something. Okay. If we do, we need to change it. Yeah. Yes. So, so, what, yeah, exactly. so what we've got on the agenda is action regarding the award of the contract for the retiree group medical supplemental insurance for 2022. We also have a budget issue. We don't have anything on the policy, so I think that if, if this is the board is going to approve Mr. Fuente's motion, I think 
when y'all are done discussing it, you should take action on that. And then I can think that if that motion passes and that is going to be a change, then we should look at the policy and at the next board meeting, sure. we okay. should bring back a yeah. policy change if one is necessary. Okay, so. that sounds good. So please restate your motion so that we make sure that we know what we're voting on. Let me see if I can do that. <laughs> I move the dis I move that the discontinue see. I move we discontinue the reference program effective January first with the twenty twenty four budget going forward. For for what? For the issuance of this benefit. Yeah, it, but I think we, we wanted to clarify that current Can you read what I wrote down what you said first? <laughs> You said to continue the program with existing retirees, but remove the program for, for all future retirees starting 1-1-24. One, one, I, I go with that. Okay. okay. <laughs> and you're okay with that second, Mr. Uh, Richard? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's vote. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. The motion passes. And so now, Jeff, if you'll investigate whether there is a policy that we need to uh, bring up to the agenda. Please add it to the agenda for our next meeting. Okay. All right. So um, our next action item is consider adoption of fiscal year 2024 Tarrant Appraisal District Annual Budget. And do we have a presentation for that before we get into any action? Not, not really a presentation. We have some. Um, don't tell me the uh, bulb is what going out of the projector. Uh, our projector over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of course, the PowerPoints were provided in your packet, and yes. also they were provided online uh, for everyone to see. But uh, but that's for the public to see. So yeah. Um, what tab in the notebook are we in now? Oh, we're in seven. I'm going to call for a five-minute recess so we can look at the technology and try to get that fixed. It would be. And also because. We're going to get started again. I apologize that our projector went out. I guess we need to add that to the budget for, for this year. <laughs> Speaking of budgets, but <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's get it updated. Um, so uh, our attorney uh, wisely brought the point up that we still need a motion to approve the budget, the contract for retiree uh, group medical supplemental insurance with a with a new. Um, pol I guess policy is going to go into effect at that time. So I need a motion to approve this this contract as amended by our prior motion. I'll so move as it's inconsistent with our previous motion. Second. So. Okay, we have first motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so we're good. So now we can go to uh, 7B. Uh, the budget. Um, I know we've discussed this at length. So, um, well, we can't put it up there, but 
we'll just kind of go over the the highlights of the budget please yes, uh, yeah, this, sure. this was the we had originally proposed a budget uh, back in our, I think it was our June board meeting uh, and actually sent it out to the tax entities uh, the board met uh, at our last board meeting and had a good discussion about the budget uh, there was a recommendation that we somehow get the budget down below I think is your mic oh, oh, sorry okay there there are, sorry about that uh, we had we had a good discussion at uh, previous board meetings and our June board meeting. Uh, we had proposed a budget. We sent it out to the tax entities as required by law by June the fifteenth. Uh, at our at our last board meeting, um, there was some discussion by the board about maybe reducing the budget to something below, and I think that number was two point nine, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and we were actually able to go back and, and make some adjustments to the budget to get it down to two point seven nine percent. Uh, over the 20 year 2023 budget and our current proposed budget will be twenty nine million four hundred and twenty eight dollars and nine hundred and six I'm sorry twenty nine million four hundred twenty eight thousand nine hundred and six dollars is what the proposed budget is now uh, we'll open it up for any questions comments concerns just a question um, in, in understand this went to the tax and entities any comments back from uh, tax and entities I, we actually had zero comments from any tax entities okay and senate bill two we're going to discuss in a minute any impacts uh related to our budget uh i don't think so but yeah. i know I, I believe there will no, be an impact yeah there will the be a big impact to our budget two that we were not aware of at the time that we proposed the budget you want to talk I, about I that now or you want to talk about that then well <sighs> Well, we're going to approve the budget, right? So we yeah. need to talk to it now. Okay. What the impacts could be. Yeah, we were going to have this discussion in our in our next discussion item, but one of the elements of Senate Bill Two is to add three uh, members to this board. The board would be expanded to nine members. Three would be elected uh, at large from the county. And what we have found is that the appraisal district will have to pay for that election. Uh, we have reached out to the Tarrant County uh, Elections Administrator Office uh, asking them for input and suggestions on what that cost may be. Uh, Jeff received an email yesterday saying that they would get back to us next week. Yep. Uh, next Wednesday. They, next Wednesday. Um, but this is a topic that's obviously going around the state. Uh, other appraisal districts are asking these same questions. And Jeff has the documentation over there of all the different estimates of what this may be. And I'd like for him just to give you all the impact to the budget. Now, I've, I talked with Matthew about this issue uh, leading up to our today's meeting and, and asking the questions, should we, should we amend this budget today in, in, uh, with the concept or idea that we're gonna have to pay for this election which could possibly cause us to have to go back out and send an amended budget back to the taxing entities, delay the process. State law says we're supposed to adopt our budget by September the 15th, or could we go ahead and adopt this budget as it is written today, and then once we actually know more, uh, have better numbers, come back later on and amend the 24 budget to something else. And Matthew, I, I won't speak for Matthew, I'll let Matthew tell me what he told me. My thought on it was twofold. One is we've sent out the proposed budget to the entities. We've had the, the workshop on it. Um, and the other part is, is we don't really know what that number is going to be yet. And so the suggestion that I gave to Jeff and the suggestion I give to the rest of the board now would be that we should, assuming y'all want to, uh, adopt the budget or make whatever changes to the budget you want to make with the information we've got now. And when we get actual data from the Tarrant County Election Administrator on what the actual of the election will be uh, come back at that point in time and do a budget amendment to add that in. And we do have a legal right to, to amend our budget. Okay. We just never have done okay. it. And the, to, the election will occur in no, first Tuesday in November, is it? Uh, the first year it's going to take place in May. So in May. So it, okay, for the, for the member. Okay, I'm, yep. I'm sorry. There's two elections that we're talking about. One's November and one's May. Yep. Right. The first year the election will take place in May, and then they will serve shortened terms, the people that are elected next May, and then after that it will always be in the November general okay. election. But, but my point being that the November election will approve Senate Bill 2 under the Constitution, 
which is the requirement to have three elected. Yes. So, so okay, that yeah. Failed, then the yeah. Which it, so, uh, yeah. I think it would be helpful to put in some dates. You're saying the the constitutional amendment will be in November of 2023 but the election for these members will be May of 2024, and then subsequent elections will be November of 25 or 26 or, or whatever okay. after that. So we don't have to pay, we pay for the May election, but not yes. the November. And, and we're, and I'm gonna get, Jeff's gonna give you some numbers in a second. What we're understanding too is if, if we had, if it was in November, it would probably be cheaper on us because November is a more broad election and, and more sharing of the cost. Correct. But since it's in May, um, we may we may ha feel the brunt of the whole whole election on ourselves unless there's some city elections that are taking place. Yeah. I, I talked to my colleague down in Johnson County, and he's saying that uh, there are no city elections in May for him, so he's, he'll have to bear the cost of the whole entire election. So, Jeff, would you give what what you've learned? Sure. Yeah, we we had hoped to have numbers from uh, from Tarrant County, but they just have not gotten those together yet, and they've. Uh, told us that we should have in the middle of next week. Uh, you, you'll recall in the second the the uh, the uh, second time we talked about the budget in the workshop. We had the first workshop in May and then we had a follow-up in June. At that time we had learned that they had taken out the requirement for us to mail the postcards again and so one of the ways we were able to cut the budget then was to take that about roughly $250,000 out of the budget not knowing that we would have, you know, a replacement for that or, or more. So uh, what's going on right now is that all of the CADs around the state are trying to learn from their county election officers what they think the cost of a May election would be, but they're also trying to find out what a November election would be because I think there's some thought that there might be some, some uh, way to influence the, uh, maybe a modification to that election time before it actually happens possibly in one of, the, one of the upcoming special sessions, but uh, anyway, it's a possibility. So I'm just gonna give, they're not in any particular order, it's just as they've come in and I've tried to grab the information, but Cameron Cab, which was at Brownsville, uh, they're thinking $370,000. And the reason these are gonna be high numbers for some is that these are countywide elections, so you've gotta have every voting location available, so uh, hence the higher cost. Um, Williamson what CAD. I'm sorry. What was, what was that number again? That was 370,000 for Cameron CAD, which is Brownsville. Uh, Guadalupe, which is um, Seguin, Seguin. Uh, they're uh, 150 to $155,000. Williamson CAD, Round Rock, Georgetown, $350,000. Harris will uh, probably shock you, but they've been estimated $14 million oh, in their Jesus. election. Uh, Victoria CAD, one of the smaller mid-sized CADs, forty to hundred thousand dollars. Lubbock, uh, two hundred thousand. Denton, five hundred thousand. Um, Nueces, Corpus Christi, four hundred thousand. Ellis, um, hundred to hundred and twenty. Galveston CAD, four sixty-two, four hundred sixty-two thousand. Uh, Dallas, uh, their estimates at one million two sixty-seven. Uh, El Paso, 400 to 450 thousand dollars is the estimate they were given. Uh, Collin, Cad, Plano, McKinney, uh, 480 thousand dollars. Montgomery, Cad, um, just north of Houston, 500 thousand. Um, Bayer, uh, 700 thousand, San Antonio. Uh, Parker. Uh, Thirty-five to seventy thousand. Bell <coughs> County, Temple, Belton, one hundred seventy-four thousand. Uh, Brazos, <coughs> College Station, Bryan, seventy thousand. Uh, and then the, the most recent one I got was from Austin CAD, but that's Belleville, not 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 Austin, not Travis. Was uh, thirty-eight thousand dollars. Okay. Mr. Craig, can you email that uh, to the board? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I, I will say that's a provision of the law that I don't like uh, for the obvious reason that it's very expensive. A uh, countywide race for these seats will be expensive regardless of how expensive. I'm not really surprised that Harris County is estimating 14, 
million dollars because Harris County has particular voice to this process based on their representation. Yeah, yeah, they, they have to, yeah. Um, I won't go into uh, election integrity with my comments here. So um, there are better ways that'll be much cheaper and if um, it's an issue I'm working on uh, and trying to find a better solution than that. And uh, we are having some special sessions coming up. Uh, and with that target in mind, hopefully we, with those numbers uh, too, um, hopefully we can get some movement to a better solution to what the uh, Senate is and, and House are trying to achieve um, with that reform. I like the idea of taxpayers electing these positions, but I don't think it's worth the money and I don't think anybody will run. I think it empowers the wrong people and there's a whole bunch of things that I think aren't good about it. And I'm well, sure- the governor I, has signed it, so. He, he has now and, and so uh, personally I'm focused on the special because uh, we've got some ideas that can bring that cost down. And that's Mr. Jordan, um, your comment about amending the budget earlier, uh, if needed, we still have some time, and I think that's a good, a good approach. Uh, Mr. Chair. So, a question: and uh, in the future, if this should pass with the elections, are we still have to pay for our part of it? As I understand, I'm hoping to learn more next week. Okay. This is all new to us, so we're trying to get educated on it. But as I understand it, in any election, your cost of the election is allocated to you based on some pro rata basis for the, you know, the, the number of uh, ballot boxes. And there's, right. I guess there's a formula that-, that So the more elections we that. have, the better. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in most, sure. some of those that have started to get the November estimate, it, it's been lower than the May estimate. And, and that's obviously because November, Elections are going to be right. You know, more, countywide elections yeah. already. More things are on the ballot in yeah. November than they are in May. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a <laughs> clarification: If we were to amend uh, the budget at all today, if we change this number that we've already sent to the taxing entities, what are, what are the what are the mechanics of that? Um, today, you all can still amend the budget. Okay. You are not tied to adopting the same budget that you sent to the taxing units once you pass the budget that budget gets sent back to the taxing units and there's a mechanism by which they can go ahead and disapprove it. Um, and so that would be the entity's protection. If y'all we're gonna, we're gonna go up substantially on the amount of the budget. And then if you wanna go ahead at any point in time before you amend the budget and there's a process where you give the entities notice and again, they have the opportunity to go and tell you beforehand that they don't like the budget. And then if they wanna reject a budget amendment So just to go with, with the, the motion we just approved to uh, remove people that may retire in the future from that program, does that make an impact to these numbers? I don't, I don't believe so because you, by approving, by approving this action item, we, are, we will be paying for those retirees that are currently exist Correct. or anyone that Which was already part of the actual that, budget. That potential, <laughs> that potential is still there today and it would still be there. But that's in a liability, not in a, in a kind of a balance sheet yes. entry rather than a budget item, correct? If we had gone with Mr. Puente's first motion to where we start stepping it down, probably again, though that first one has still been 120 and 30 cents. So it was still been the same exact fiscal okay. impact to 2024, but it affected okay. future. So, so it's. Yeah. So no changes. I just wanted to clarify. Right. As of right now, we've not made any changes to this proposed budget. So I will entertain a, mo entertain a motion to accept the budget, and then we'll get a little bit more discussion. Right. Motion, second, discussion. Nope. I, I, I want okay. to make one point just okay. because um, there's a lot of discussion about budgets having no net rev new revenue. And, and the county and others who are going to approve that. We, our revenue is based on a prorated assessment to the taxing entities that they approve. So that, that is a, there is no meaning of that phrase for us. Uh, and based on Mr. Puente's direction last time and where we are, uh, it's, it's a pretty tight budget. So. So, Tony, if I could ask one more question, because it would relate to whether or not 
we'll okay. get amend or not amend, okay? If that's okay. Oh. So on the part of the law that if it's passed, there becomes a $100,000 exemption and there's various things that occur. Uh, there's a part that occurs with, com with a commercial property, et cetera. So if that all goes into place, that doesn't change our revenue. No. They didn't even change the entity's revenue because the state is essentially, well, the 100000 or not, but the buy-down, the state is paying for, yeah. it, which is our taxpayer money. That's, but it, that's it doesn't affect, affect, the tax it doesn't affect our revenue. Okay, it doesn't now, affect our revenue. You, you were saying, that, are there any other implications? I know you're going to talk about this when you talk about the bill. One of the other things in the bill is that rate compression for schools. And uh, so that essentially is going to take those school tax rates down from probably what's an average of around a dollar thirty or so to under a dollar. How that affects us? I mean, our our budget is what our budget is. Our revenue needs are what our revenue needs are, and they're the way they're allocated to all the entities is based on their local tax levy. So we take the total tax levy and whatever percent City of Fort Worth has of that. That's the percentage of our budget that they pay. What's going to change, and we just don't know how, we can't really predict what it's going to be, is that the levy of local taxes for school districts is going to be reduced because the state's going to make up that difference. But in our, in our calculations of proration, it's going to change that because, it, you know, I think just doing the math, it tells you that the school districts are going to pay a lesser percentage of our overall budget but that means that cities, counties, other districts are going to make that difference up. It, you know, ours is a net zero change. It's the budget is the budget, but how that pie gets broken up sure. has been taken out of our hands. Different entities. Will yeah, pay it, and yeah. so we 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 have notified. We've sent a letter to everybody and said we see this is going to happen. We just don't know what it is. We won't know till all those rates are set. You know what it's going to be. We don't, we, and we won't. We'll use our September certified <laughs> numbers which they're not done yet, you know, for September, but we don't know what those tax rates are going to be yet. So that, to, to me, that's another impact from the legislation that I'm not sure was considered probably, it probably wasn't uh, material in any, any thinking of, you know, the legislation, but it is going to have an individual impact on the various entities that we serve, if that, if that makes sense. Yes. Just, just to point, and, and we're going to get to the discussion of the legislation, but the when when you all sent the certifications to the taxing entities, they got two numbers. Yes, they did. The before and after. Yes, so they did. So they already know, the taxing entities, when they received our budget, they already had both numbers for, well, when, for values. What, let's clarify what we sent them. We sent them a certified appraisal roll saying this is the total value, this is the total taxable value you'll have to tax. And that doesn't change? That, well, no, it won't. Well, it, it may change a little bit as, as, as adjustments to the but appraisal not roll. But, but, but not law. anything to do with our budget, nothing to do with the new law. Yeah. But I was required to send them a certified roll based upon the $40,000 exemption, and I was required to send them a certified roll based upon the $100,000 exemption. And it wound up being that the Texas Education Agency wanted the data from the $40,000 exemption roll, and the comptroller's office was wanting the data from the $100,000 roll. So we, we certified two rolls this year and, and gave that out. But our taxing entities have both numbers. They have both numbers, yes. And they also have our, 20, our 2024 proposed budget. And then they have right now. You gave them an estimate of what the allocation would be, and that was before. We do, we, when we send the, the proposed budget, we give them an estimate of the allocation, but we tell them clearly that that's an estimate based yeah. on the tax rates from this year. Yes, and when we sent that in on values, June, certified values from this year. Yeah, and when we sent that on June the fifteenth, Senate Bill Two had not even been. Yeah, well, I'm not going to say it hadn't been thought of because it was too thick of a book. <laughs> too thick of a law to not have been thought of, but it had not been published, it had not been put out there or anything like that, the rate compression aspect of it. So we sent another letter to the tax unit to say, we gave you an estimate, but for school districts, your estimate's gonna go down, and for cities and yeah, counties it, and other from, districts, from year to year, I'm sorry, from year to year to year, that, that estimate in the proposed doesn't really change, but it doesn't fluctuate a great deal. You'd have to have a lot, you know, uh, in order to amount of new construction or something in a particular entity to, to kind of make an impact there. But yeah. Uh, well, my po my po only point is in full respect of transparency, the taxing entities, the people that pay for our budget, 
already have visibility of what the number is the going yes. to be to set their tax rate. Yes. Even though they've not done that, a uh, couple have, are, yes. are, are talking about it anyway. I think well, the county is the only one that I've seen that has said it right. Did they vote on it? The county yeah. has voted yeah, the county on did. The, the, county did. the tax rate? They haven't voted on the tax rate yet. They have not. Oh, okay. they voted on just the discussion. They okay. voted on the exemption. Exemption, right? The exemption. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. exemption the exemptions okay. have all been. Okay. But okay. In, in order of transparency, yes. they, they're dealing with a full deck. Yes. And I and move approval of our budget at the 2.6. No, 29.428. Yeah, but the increase was 2.7. Oh, 2.79%. 2.79. Okay. And JR, you had a question? Well, I will second, then I'll ask my question. Okay. It's part of it. We, so. got, a <laughs> we got a motion and a second, and we have a question. Uh, so the question is, time frame wise, if we need to, I guess, adjust our budget and make an amendment, how fast do we have to get the, that information out to the taxing entities? I, I will, so, since we've never amended a budget, I'll defer to Matthew and see so, if he has uh, experience uh, with yeah, that. Did. Amendment to the budget. And the reason I ask is, so let's say, for instance, we get our numbers next week from uh, the numbers that we need. From Tarrant County. Elections. From Tarrant County, thank you. And do we go ahead and make the amendment then, or do we wait until November to make sure this passes? Or I'm just I would, uh, if I can throw out my opinion, I think we would uh, listen to what Mr. Diaz has added and said, if there is gonna be a special session, and if the legislature is looking at some alternatives, I would think we at least give that process time to run before we try to take up any amendment uh, issue. Yeah, right. yeah. uh, <laughs> so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or any other questions? I wanna thank the staff uh, for, and Jeff Craig in particular, for finding the number uh, and finding the way for us to get to um, the increase the average um, CPI over the last 40 years is about two and a half percent. I imagine these days it's higher than that. And we're uh, at, at 2.8, essentially a little under 2.8. And I'm proud of the work that you've done to get us there. Uh, just one comment I want to make actually to the, to the, to the, our guests that are here, you know, people came up and talked about the budget and so forth. And that's one thing in a, in a business and the other boards I serve on a budget's a budget. That, we, that the board is to hold the entity accountable for. The chief appraiser's job is to be sure also that we don't go over budget and if possible, save money. It doesn't mean we have to spend the money because we approve the budget. I think that is the, the, the job, that, one of the jobs of the chief appraiser and of this board to hold them accountable to that budget and see if there's ways to save. But again, also to the public, things like an unfunded mandate, which just come to us by way of an election, that could cost sounds like three hundred fifty thousand or more dollars. That's we 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 have no choice. We have to spend that money, and that money's not budgeted. But just keep in mind, budget doesn't mean we have to spend it. Chief appraiser hopefully works to cut that down during the course of the year. The board hopefully keeps that all accountable, and then we end up with a uh, spending less than what we budget. Hopefully, if that's the case, or we have unfunded mandates and we got to amend the budget. So that's just a comment to the public. Uh, it could potentially be almost 5% of our budget, an increase of 5% of our budget if it's somewhere around a million dollars like Dallas County, so. Well, we'll right. be so, uh, <laughs> Let's we'll, still use them as a guy. We're not quite as big, but yeah. we are almost that big. It's really about yeah. the number of voting number of boxes, yeah. boxes that you're paying for, so. All right, so let's go ahead and vote on the, on the budget. Uh, all those uh, in favor of the budget proposed for 2024, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the budget has passed. Um, you have what you need for that. And then we're gonna move on to discussion items. Uh, we're gonna have a report on Senate Bill 2. We've talked a lot about it. Um, and we still have a, a executive session, so uh, let's do a quick report and see if we can keep that pretty tightened down and, 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 and not get into too many. Just an update report, the impact to, to our, uh, our institution, our district, and uh, we'll, we're going to keep this pretty tight so we can move on to our, uh, the next items. Yeah, I'm going to ask Matthew to kind of run down. Uh, Matthew's done a lot of study on this and given advice to a lot of appraisal districts about this. And I will take your 
uh, your, 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 your statement to be brief, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I appreciate that. Best of luck. Um, there are really, I think, to I say that and then you give the microphone to an attorney. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, taxpayers, I think, are going to see real three real differences based on Senate Bill 2. Uh, the biggest one is that school district tax rates are going to be compressed again. Uh, Senate Bill 2 reduced them by a little bit over 10 cents. Uh, there was also an additional 8 cents compression that was already in effect in the law from the prior year. Uh, the result is going to be that school tax rates, which have sort of been around a dollar, a dollar three, are probably going to drop depending on your individual school district to probably 85, 88, 88 cents, uh, which will reduce uh, the amount of taxes that property owners pay to school districts. The second big change that impacts property owners is the homestead exemption has been increased. Uh, four years ago, we had a homestead exemption of $25,000 for school purposes only. Uh, two years ago, they increased that to $40,000. And assuming that the constitutional amendment passes, that is now going to be a $100,000 exemption. I think one of the things that hasn't been covered in the media on Senate Bill 2 as clearly as maybe it should have been is that $100,000 exemption only applies to school taxes. So your city taxes, your county taxes, any special district. Uh, uh, those exemptions are going to be what they've been in the past. So taxpayers should see a reduction in the school portion of their property taxes based on that. But the other entities that they pay it to are going to basically stay stay where they have been. Unless, unless they got a, a instituted a new exemption this year. Exactly. Like, Certainly like local governing county. bodies could have adopted a local option exemption, which increased, which would then be a benefit this year. Uh, the third thing that got passed uh, in it that's really going to go ahead and impact property owners is what they're calling a circuit breaker. I would call it an appraisal cap on uh, non-residents homestead properties. The reason they're calling it a circuit breaker is because it is a 20% limit on increase. So you have an apartment complex that was appraised at a million dollars and its market value goes up to $1.3 million. It's going to be capped a 20% increase, so it would get appraised at $1.2 million. 2023 or 2024 is going to be the baseline year, so non-homestead property owners won't see a benefit of that until 2025. Um, and it also only applies to, I'd say, lower valued properties, uh, properties with a value of under $5 million. That $5 million is going to get adjusted for the consumer price index, which Mr. Diot was just talking about. Uh, the other big change is the way that this board is selected is going to be different. We're going to have nine members. We're going to have three that are elected by the public at large in a countywide election, and there will be staggered terms. So the five members that are appointed by the entities will be uh, in even number years and the three three members that are going to be elected by the public at large will be at odd number years and every year somebody will come on and the tax assessor collector will continue to serve as an ex officio member but the tax assessor collector gets to start voting as of july 1 of uh of next year um other thing i'm going to bring up uh for y'all just because it's something we've talked about a lot is uh, one of the th items that we talked about when Ms. Wildman left the board was how to fill a vacancy in the board. And this board um, expressed an opinion and ultimately took action that said that if the entities appointed people to the board of directors, that it ought to be the entities who chose uh, their replacements. And apparently the Texas legislature disagrees with us on that <laughs> because they rewrote all the sections dealing with how you fill vacancies for the larger counties like ours, uh, and they have left it. If it is something that has been appointed by the entities, the process is going to stay the same. The entities are going to nominate people to fill the vacancy. This board is ultimately going to choose who fills the vacancy. And if it's an elected position, elected by the public at large, uh, then the board is going to go ahead and just select somebody to fill out the remainder of the term. So despite the efforts of this board and the comments that were made here, uh, apparently the legislature thinks that, that this board should be filling vacancies when they occur. Um, I think that's everything that really is is impactful. Are you but. Members? 
I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that is the other one. Is uh, back many years ago, I'm not even sure how many years it was, uh, the Appraisal District Board of Directors appointed the members to the Appraisal Review Board. And then several years ago, they switched it to where the local administrative district judges were the ones who were appointing the ARB members. And in larger counties, population over 75,000, like Tarrant, this board is going to get that job back again. And you all will start appointing ARB members, uh, not for the 2024 year, but for the 2025 year. And the kind of wrinkle to it is that you're going to now have three members that are elected by the public at large and any member that's going to get appointed to the ARB is going to require at least two of the elected members so you'll have to get five of the board as a whole to get a majority and of the five that vote to appoint a specific member to the ARB at least two of those will have to be from the members that have been elected by the public at large it's okay. pretty complicated um, so there seems like there's some good a, and some bad and kind of a mixed bag of everything uh, in there for us but thank you for the summary I appreciate it and appreciate your brevity uh, we'll take just a few minutes for questions and discussion but um, uh, go ahead I'll be short uh, thank you there is a requirement for Miss Burgess's office when she sends out the tax bill to include both what it would have been and what it is now uh, the tax bill so the other item, I think, um, just the point is this restarts, it doesn't change the valuation process that TAD has. Uh, so it, this year it'll be one value and it'll be based on uh, the appreciation of items going forward as to how much the increases are in the future. So uh, it could. It, it'll be great this year and we all I, I think um, this is great for the taxpayer and uh, support it and I think the compression rates on schools is, is superb I, I think the governor is right on target with that so just my editorial remark yeah okay let's go this way um, there was uh, in the process of get things were moving very fast uh, with this bill and the real battle was between business interests and homeowners and both chambers kind of took their positions and slugged it out and so we ended up with um, the big issue uh, being compression and the exemption um, did did they go to four-year terms or are we still at two no they're four-year terms four-year staggered terms once it everything gets evened out at the beginning there's some staggering, so there'll be some year and a half terms, some one year terms, right. and some two year terms, but ultimately it'll be four year terms. So that's a significant uh, thing for this board um, there. Uh, and I've got a question about open meetings laws. The board doesn't discuss business. Can, can the board offline have discussions generally about legislation, which isn't before the, this board? Yeah, the rule on what you are prohibited from discussing amongst a quorum of the board is anything that is going to come before this board at some point in time. And so if you are talking about other issues, other political issues that aren't going to have something, a decision that this board is going to make, then that is outside of the prohibition uh, of more than a quorum of this board talking. So. So, okay, so let me ask clearly, we can't affect legislation, we're not voting. So. Right. The, the discussing Senate Bill 2 is fine because we just have to, we don't make a decision on it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think if, if the members of this board you wanted to go down and to the legislature or individually write letters or do something like that and you wanted to have a discussion with more than a quorum of the board about what you were going to do with that, uh, that's not something this board would ever vote on or would ever come before this board to make a decision on. The idea of the Open Meetings Act is that the deliberations of the things that fall under your jurisdiction all have to be done in the light of day so that it's transparent and the public knows why you're making those decisions the reason I'm asking the question is the legislatures I don't remember how many specials they've had special sessions but there is a point where they decide I'm tired of this I want to go home and I'm not interested in making any changes and I think some of these changes need some help and I think it would be good if and I, that's why I'm asking the question if this board 
felt the freedom to discuss with each other uh, what's going on in Austin over the next couple of months. We don't even meet again until November. Um, it'll all be set in stone at that point. So um, that's why I'm asking. I think those discussions would be within the would, would be in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Thank you, uh, Vince. Anything? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, then we'll move on. I think everybody said what they wanted to say. Okay. So we're going to let's see, information items a report by taxpayer liaison officer. For the months of May, June, and July, I had a total of 17 issues, complaints, and concerns, um, and they were all about ARB hearings. Um, several property owners had to wait over an hour for their hearing, and they didn't read the information that goes with the value statement, the blue pages that says if you have to wait two hours you can be rescheduled um, several told me that they didn't read the material because it was so long and i said it is long but it you know it's tax code and you need to know what it's being what's being said it's nine pages now so it is it is long but i keep reiterating to these people that you really need to look at that those blue pages and it, it really helps you when you come into your hearing, you understand things a lot more. Um, we had several um, property owners that submitted their evidence too late. And I was a little per per perplexed about that because the tax code says that property owner's evidence must be submitted before the hearing begins. So I'm not sure why you know, it wasn't there if they if they didn't bring it. Several others complained that they sent their evidence to Tad before the hearing date, and Tad didn't have it when the hearing was began. Um, I also recommended that to be on the safe side, it's best if they can bring copies with them when they come to the hearing. And it's, that's okay because the tax code says that they just have to have it before the hearing begins. And uh, the biggest complaint I had was um, property owner had complaints about the IRB panel members being racist and didn't understand looking at the comps that were presented by the TAD appraisers. There were nine very good comps that were presented by the appraiser. Um, he said that the evidence, he, the only evidence he had was that his home had not been updated like the other comps on his street. So his comps came from the houses around him on his street, not from sales. So um, I explained that to him. And um, he had some, he did have some um, cost to, to upgrade his home. I asked Mr. Watkins to listen to the uh, hearing. I listened to it, and uh, but I wanted someone else to listen to it too. And he, I asked Mr. Watkins to listen to the recording, and he did not hear the property owner mention race discrimination or bids for improvements to his property. So I sent him 23.01 from the tax code that comps have to be recent sales and that if he wished to further appeal there were instructions how to do so which came with the final order from tad his last comment was this still remains a very serious and delicate matter that could end up facing public scrutiny and that completes my report <laughs> thank you mr jacobson uh move on to report by chief appraiser yes thank you um, I'll be quick. Taxpayer protest. I'm going to hit two things, the certification and the protest. In 2023, uh, as of when I pulled this information, there were 214,268 protests that had been filed, actually filed protest. 
2022, for comparison, it was 197,000, 214 and 290, or 197 filed. Uh, we did see values go up quite a bit this year. It, it represents an 11 percent percent let me start over. The 214,000 represents 11% of the total 1.8 million accounts that TAD has, which includes both real, uh, real personal and mineral accounts. 111,000 protests were filed through our online uh, tool via our website. Uh, 16,000 accounts went through the online negotiation tool on our website. Uh, of those 16,000, uh, nearly 8,000 were settled via the negotiation tool to the taxpayers' um, well, they might not have been completely happy, but they agreed to the value and, and they, they were settled. 4,000 of those uh, accounts were rejected by the taxpayers, probably were, went on to, to file an actual protest and, and go to a hearing. And then 4,000 were left pending at the time of certification. Uh, TAD certified the 2023 appraisal roll on time this year again. The appraisal review board approved the appraisal records on July the 20th and TAD began the certification process on July the 21st. Certification documents were delivered to all the taxing units on the 25th of July. Um, some, of the, some of the numbers with regards to the certification, Tarrant County taxable value, not market value, but taxable value was up 13% over the 2022 values. That's part of the reason why we had a large increase in, in protest. The City of Fort Worth taxable value was up 14% over 2022. And then the Tarrant County market value, to give you kind of some ideas, it went from $328 billion of market value to $391 billion in market value. Tarrant County taxable value, though, the difference between market and taxable, uh, it went from $263 billion to $287 billion. To give you a little bit of idea of what's the difference between market value and taxable value, uh, a lot of that has to do with the exemptions that uh, a lot of the taxing entities offer. And it also has to do a lot with the 10 percent appraisal cap on homesteaded properties. Uh, it also has some to do with uh, we have about close to 5,000 accounts that have agricultural value. So instead of them being taxed at their market value, they're taxed at an agricultural value. So that's that's the large difference between the two. Uh, a little bit more information. Total residential accounts right now uh, equate to 642,000 residential accounts. We have 59,000 commercial accounts. We have 63,000 business personal property accounts. And we have 1.1 million uh, mineral accounts still. So we have a total accounts in the county of 1,872,000. Uh, uh, the appraisal district has been in contact with uh, Ms. Burgess's office about the recalculation of the tax ceilings. One of the things of Senate Bill 2 uh, actually is, is that with them lowering the, or actually raising the exemption from 40,000 to 100,000, everyone who has an over 65 tax ceiling or a disability tax ceiling, that will have to be recalculated and adjusted to give them the benefit of that extra uh, exemption. And as of right now, it looks like 140,000 properties um, on TAD's appraisal roll will be recalculated as a result of that. Um, it's actually because of Senate Bill 12 and Senate Bill 2. Senate Bill 12 is actually a, a tax rate compression element that came from last session. Senate Bill 2 is the, the information from this session. Um, we'll have to wait until we actually get the, the maximum compression rate information from the Texas Education Agency before we can actually make those calculations. We will actually also be adjusting some 2022 ceilings and some 2021 ceilings. There'll be almost 7,500 accounts for 2022 and about 6,700 accounts for 2021. That concludes my report, unless you have questions. Uh, may we get an email copy of that report, sure. please? Um, I think in round numbers, how many, you said we had about 214,000 protests this year. Yes, uh, uh, the proportion you gave us was of all the accounts. The minerals are not significant. Um, most of them, there's a million of them, um, but they're uh, overall pretty small as I understand it. Um, and I understand we have about, I'm going to round it to 750,000 residential and commercial. Yeah, and, and taxable, yeah, in, in that ballpark, yeah. Okay, so we're almost a third of the residential and commercial. You didn't have any protests on the mineral accounts at we all, do have it? some but we do have some but it's like you said they're somewhat minimal i do anticipate this year we'll wind up having more because the mineral values went up nearly 40 percent so we that will generate more mineral accounts than what we typically have okay. thank you thank you jeff for that report um 
without any further questions, then we'll move on to item 10. Um, we're going to recess to executive session pursuant to the following parts of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Government Code Chapter 551 for the following purposes. Section 551.074, deliberation on the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee related to the letter of repair delivered to the chief appraiser on April 10, 2023. Uh, and B, hear complaints or charges made up by a former employee against officers and employees of the Town Appraisal District pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.074. So that's, uh, you got it? Okay. Just take a quick five minute break and then we'll meet in the executive session room.
Okay, we're back on. And uh, we are coming back to open session officially now. Uh, it's 2.05. Thank you all for your patience again as we deliberated in executive session. Um, we're going to reconvene an open session for possible further discussion and possible action on items deliberated in executive session related to the letter of repair delivered to the chief appraiser on April 10, 2023, including the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of the chief appraiser. Um, and at this point, I'll open it up if anybody wants to make any comments. Anybody want to start? I have a motion. Okay. Go ahead. I'd like to move for a vote of confidence in the chief appraiser. A yes vote would be yes, I have confidence, and a no vote would be no, I don't have confidence. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Is that me? Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Any uh, further discussion? I, I have a few things to say, but if anybody else wants to make any comments uh, or observations, uh, open. I think we're hitting a balance, and I'll make this quick, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, w w there are... Uh, in many ways, the employees of TAD are doing a very good job, and it shows in the numbers. And I congratulate all of them for that. This really boils down to issues that came up that continually have been coming up, um, where the chief appraiser, in my view, has, has um, taken positions that were uh, against certain taxpayers. And uh, I felt like that representation is problematic and then um, after a suspension uh, an article comes out in a newspaper where he's quoted as saying something that the reporter acknowledged there was a veiled reference there to a, a certain individual and it's like uh, kill, it's still swinging um, and it's not really addressed and I'm concerned about that I'm really concerned that in March we had uh, a hearing here a discussion item on the agenda about the website and I had those concerns because uh, and that's why we talked about it in, on the agenda that I was hearing that we took the website down and we put one back up and four months later it was not functioning at all taxpayers were greatly harmed by that at least uh, many people that I heard of expressed their frustrations and and so how that happened and why that happened, I don't know if there was um, ultimately something behind redoing everything at that point um, other than just updating it. And uh, the term uh, e-commerce site was thrown around a few times. And um, it, it just seemed like the system worked really much, much better last year. And I don't think we did any, ourselves any favors by redoing the website when we did and I was concerned that it would be up and running by the middle of April when we sent notices out and we were sure that it would be and it it wasn't people could not get on they when they got on they were kicked off or they had to wait for screens to load they couldn't download their evidence they um, had numerous problems buttons on the website weren't working and this has all been mostly rectified at this point but in the time where people are supposed to be protesting they should be able to get that information and so um, that's where my concerns have been and always have been and if people are are, are in any way a target of a governmental entity I want to I want to make sure we do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen thank you any, any other comments um, I'm sorry, yes, sir. Oh, go ahead. Uh, again, just to share with the public that I want the public to know that um, this board took this subject very seriously. Uh, there's always two sides to any question. Um, and uh, there was a very thorough review done of the response. And, um, you know, it, it's a question of whether or not Got to hold it down for a minute, I think, or for a few seconds. Yeah, it's on there. Yeah. You got to start all over. Oh, man. Never comes out the same way a second time. Exactly. 
bottom line, I want the public to realize that this was, at least in this meeting, and we got the, the response several weeks ago. I, I believe every board member here took a strong look at it. There was a lot to look at. There was a three-letter three letter summary that I was exposed to of what the issues were, and then there was 11 bullet points of responses requested of Jeff. Um, I think the, the, the challenge here is, again, I was not here when the letter was issued, but that it's a question of was the letter of repair directed at uh, Mr. Law himself and what he was going to do to change things, or was it directed at uh, TAD as a general organization? And the, the response was primarily TAD as a general uh, organization. So there's a differentiation. Again, I've only got able to go by what's in the actual letter, the text, me reading it and trying to interpret it. Uh, but I do want to say that it was all issues were seriously considered, reviewed, and uh, I think in, in our best effort, we're trying to be transparent and be within the law. Anything over here? Well, I think um, the, this whole um, and, and process, I'm going to say process because it really is not an exercise, it's a process, was in, uh, informational to all of us, and we appreciate the public's input on this. Um, we have learned in, in, in something that management needs to know, the board needs to know. We need to be exceptional in the communication that goes to the public on, on this issue. Uh, property tax is a very, uh, uh, it, we've all spent a lot of time on it, the legislature, taxing entities, et cetera. It's a very important thing. Anytime you involve taxation, you expect excellence in what you do. We've learned a lesson in communication, both by uh, the chief appraiser and communication by this board needs to be much better going forward, and we're going to work on that together. Jeff? Um, I guess the only thing I'll say is that uh, I appreciate the board's um, work on this. And uh, as uh, Mr. Puente mentioned, there was a lot of time spent on it. And I appreciate your time and effort and the staff's time and effort because the, those reports, you didn't sit there and write all those reports. I know that your staff helped a lot. And so we appreciate the efforts of the staff. Um, and sure, we went through some difficult times. And I think uh, for the most part, we've, we're past that and we're making improvements. I, obviously, there's always room for more improvement. Um, every organization has that. But I think the big things that we needed to address have been addressed, and I can I just encourage you to continue to keep those lines of communication with the board open and with the public open, uh, so that um, in as far as we can, we can uh, uh, share with them what's going on kind of behind behind the doors. And so, uh, Ms. Burgess, I did you have anything? All right. With that, we have a motion and we have a second. Um, again. Uh, Restate your motion, please, be right before we vote. It's a, a motion of confidence. A yes vote would be yes, confidence exists, and a no vote is uh, we have no confidence. Okay. Of the chief appraiser. Of the chief appraiser. Uh, okay. So uh, and all again, those... that, that that comes with the comments that I gave before, um, that the staff on many, many levels is doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and vote. Uh, all those that say yes, please raise your hand, say aye. aye. No? Any abstentions? Okay, so we have a three to two vote, the yes vote wins. So uh, thank you all for that again. Um, let's see, we have a next meeting is uh, November 10th. And I know for <coughs> sure we expect a, a presentation on the impact of our decision on that uh, on that item that we voted earlier. Uh, were there any other items that we wanted to, that we discussed, including in our next agenda? Were you referring to that other item as bringing back a policy in November, or do we want to have a. Would yeah, Mr. we should have that. Yeah, Mr. Puente's uh, motion to do away with the discontinue. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, change. that we're going to have a presentation, whether that's a policy change, amendment, or okay. whatever that that is that we need to bring that to the board yeah so for clarity 
if let's say, you know, a week, couple weeks before the meeting or week before the meeting, I think, oh, I wish I would have said this. What is the procedure to get something added to the uh, agenda if there is no meeting or if we're not in the meeting? Uh, Wendy's shaking her head no, but. Was, say, say that again. What's your question? If I, let's say somewhere between now and November 10th, I have a thought, oh, I'd, I'd like this on the, on the agenda. Oh, what to add the, an item to the agenda. Our right. policy states that two members can have something added to the agenda. So if I email you and I've got a second that I can confirm, then that will put it on the agenda. Is that, is that the best way to do it or is it, is it to send it to staff? They put um, the, the, the agenda together. Yeah, if you've already got your two and you want to send it to staff, that's probably a good way to do it, although you could also send it to the chair. Uh, either one of those is okay. Okay. I usually get the agenda well before it comes to you so I can look at it. And then I'll make a comment. We really, I felt there wasn't enough time. I need a weekend between getting information for the meeting and the meeting itself. So uh, I, would, I would really like to encourage, I don't know what the rules are. I don't care what the rules are. I need more time to review the information. Probably still won't do it until the night before, but I'd like to feel like I got more time. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. With that. Got that. We can absolutely try to do that. Sometimes when we're dealing with certain contracts or certain financial things, it may be that we don't have all the information that far in advance, but we can we can try. So what, what delayed it this time then? Uh, just uh, getting some information with regards to y'all's uh, motion to put the uh, executive session on, uh, talk, communicating with Matthew, communicating with the, the chair and how that was, how that was supposed to be put on the okay. agenda. That's, that's really the delay there. Generally, adding a topic to the agenda isn't that big a deal. Adding an individual to our executive session, that was a, I get that was, that was a concern. Yeah. So that, that's what really delayed it, so specifically. Okay, if nothing else, I, I think that we have been informed that we have a birthday today. Yes. Ms. Burgess. So, so if y'all would. And Mr. Puente volunteered to sing you happy birthday. No, no, I volunteered so us to sing her. If y'all would, and, and I welcome the... Uh, public to join us <laughs> on a count of three. One, two, a one, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Wendy. Happy birthday to you. And I'm glad we all have jobs other than singers, <laughs> by the way, just here and sitting here. So without, without, we'll adjourn this uh, meeting. Thank you all.